McDermott McNichol trying to find Jack O'Shea he will oh nice chip by Jack O'Shea back to Noel Roach the clear man couldn't get to it Robert Flower here good pass by Flower Stephen Kernahan and the kick from him yes three points it was a good breakaway by Robert Flower the number 10 the kick to Stephen Kernahan and three points well earned by the Australians well good afternoon to you and welcome on a day in which we have an historic first on the program that's a live broadcast from Australia of what should be a tremendous tussle this afternoon our time it's nighttime their time and that is the touring Irish party against the Australian in the compromise rules now we'll be going over there live and we'll be picking up them but here in the studio with me I've got two people who will be analyzing and giving their comments on the things that we will see and the things that they have seen in the course of the afternoon well-known referee Seamus Aldrich and it's very nice to have you here nice and also a famous Dublin player Brian Mullins nice to see both of you somebody let me start off Seamus with you straight away by somebody who walks in home now and has read nothing and knows nothing about this and sees a fella picking the ball off the ground what is the biggest thing in fact the biggest difference that he will see uh, the biggest difference he'll see Liam is that um, the player can pick the ball off the ground that is permitted he'll see the player been allowed six steps as against four under GA rules you see the referee having no involvement in time keeping at all uh, that will be done he'll he'll see the referee having little involvement in subs there'll be an interchange zone each side of the pitch where a steward an official steward will be and he will absolutely control the introduction of substitutes this takes a lot of uh, work off the referee he'll right. see a different tackle uh, as we're used to seeing in Gaelic games uh, at home. Uh, basically, uh, it incorporates the, the tackle within uh, our own game at home, but uh, he will see uh, an Australian or Irish player been allowed grip uh, an opponent between the shoulder and the waist uh, and uh, tackle him in that fashion. Now, he can grip his body or his jersey. Now, um, the onus then is on the player in possession to release the ball when he's in that situation and this I think is going to be a, a problem for the Irish players in particular. It um, could be in that particular area. It could be in that yeah. particular. There are yeah. other little interesting yeah. points, but I think those are the, the major sure. issues. Well, we'll pick those up as we go through the uh, course of the afternoon. Brian, there's been uh, much uh, capital made in the press about the fact that the Irish players, because they're amateur, because they're all men who have uh, work on the one hand and they play the sport in an amateur way and the other, could not possibly be as fit as men who are essentially professionals. What's your reaction to that? Um, my basic reaction is that I, it's not very. It doesn't hold uh, really in, in practice. Uh, the lads that have gone out have been uh, training all summer. They know from a very early stage in the summer that they would have been involved in this, or they had a chance to be involved in it. So they kept themselves very fit. And uh, th there's only so much training you can do. Like sure. you can, sp you can't spend 24 hours a day at training. You know. And all right, the Irish players have uh, other. Uh, jobs to do and whatnot, but um, I don't think that comes into question when they go out and, and uh, play their sport. Yes. Uh, the, all the Irish players are people who have excelled at their own uh, sport. They've trained very hard for it, and I've no doubt, but they're as fit at least as the Australians. So you, you think the fitness one will not be a factor this afternoon, anyway? Now there was one suggestion um, that cropped up in the reports of the previous match, the only match up to now that has been played in Australia, and that was when the Irish were beaten 60-51 at Bunbury, and it was said that the Irish players failed no noticeably in the last 15 minutes. In view of what you said now, do you think that that may have been a tactical ploy being? Well, it's very difficult to say, but some, uh, some of it might be uh, related to jet lag or, you know, the, the hardship they had out a, a few days previous to that. And, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it'll only tell today in the last quarter whether they have yeah. whether they have fate or not. Maybe, I mean, when you go in to play a different kind of game, I think the biggest problem will be the four quarters. The Irish players are used to two halves, yeah. and the four quarters, that could be an issue as regards making them tired. Maybe they're not trained specifically for that. Yeah. So the, that could be the reason why they faded so badly in the last quarter. But I'm sure Kevin Heffern has been aware of that, and he's been trying to do something about it in the meantime. And maybe the substitutions today will have 
have a, a, a say in that in the sense that he'd take off players at times to save them for later on in the game so that maybe hopefully that he will be going as many of his players will be as going as strong in the last quarter as they will be in the first now it's interesting that you talk about the substitutions because they have a different form of substitution when a sub goes on in our own yeah. game here that's it he's on yeah, yeah. and he uh, if in fact he has to go off for any reason afterwards, yeah. that's the end yeah, of his yeah, participation. Yeah, yeah. As a player and as a captain, do you think that this idea of kind of roll on, roll off substitutes is an improvement on the system we have here? Very difficult to say is an improvement. It's definitely a difference, and uh, it's one that's worth looking at and seeing. Uh, is it worthwhile? Uh, teams have felt restricted in the past by uh, having to say, "Well, if I put him in, he has to stay in there." Sure. Uh, and uh, managers and coaches and trainers would have been slow to kind of take that chance. Now that we give an opportunity where if a player goes in and he's not performing up to what they feel is necessary, they can take him out again, and that, that's definitely an advantage. Yeah. So it, it really is going to be something that uh, you'll be looking at very yeah. analytically to see how yeah. effective or otherwise it is from an Irish point of view. Yeah. I mean, the Australians know how it works anyway. Yeah. I, think it, I think it's a gambit that can uh, help your game. Yeah. And it's, it definitely calls for more participation of the 20 or 22 sure. players that are named. Whereas you know in a Gaelic football match there's only 18 players that can actually have an input to the game. Whereas here every one of the 22 that you select are going to be involved in it at some stage. Yeah. And you can use them in different ways. And as I said earlier, vis-a-vis uh, -vis rest and things like that, you could definitely, uh, uh, it's a plus. All right. Seamus, the passing is different. And in fact we've seen accounts in the paper where a famous man named Cable uh, made himself available to the Irish during the week to show them, in fact, how to control this particular fisted pass that they have. Yep. Do you think that that uh, is going to be instrumental in the outcome today? Because it's about distribution of the ball, isn't it, with accuracy? Well, of course, the Australians, as I see it, would have the edge in that because that has been their game. And in the compromise rules, this is one area that certainly favours the Australians. But uh, older uh, players uh, in the Irish party will remember that that was type of the past that was in Gaelic games some time ago. Uh -huh. So it, it's a slight adjustment. The only change really is that they have to hit it with the clench fist yeah. and uh, usually with a w in the area of the thumb. Sure. But um, I don't see it as a major problem. Well, we'll see what's going to happen because they're playing, of course, many thousands of miles away from us and it's hoped that there will be 20,000 people at the game today in Western Australian cricket ground. But to get an idea now, as uh, let's see, it is nearly half past 12 here, our time. Let's see what it's like night time out there in Perth. In fact, that's where we join Jerk Canning and he gives us a preview of the game which will be due to start very shortly now. Hello, good afternoon and welcome to you. Welcome to Perth, the capital of Western Australia. Yes, the cream of Ireland's Gaelic football talent has assembled 12,000 miles down under to take on the very best in the Aussies rules games. It's the best of three international tests. The first here tonight being played in the Wacker Stadium, which is the West Australia Cricket Association's ground. I say tonight, of course, because we're seven hours ahead of you. Uh, nonetheless, we're looking forward to a marvellous evening sport. Already, the Irish team has been here for the last nine days. They're in very good spirits. They've been training twice a day sometimes under their trainer, Kevin Heffernan. The spirits are very high, and they've already had one game against the Australians. That was down in Bunbury, which is about 120 miles south of here. And after that performance, the Irish are full of hope that on this occasion, they can take the laurels with them. It won't be easy, of course, because from what I've seen of the Australians already, the Australian team of 1986 looks a good deal stronger than the Aussies will remember from Ireland in 84. The teams will be coming out on the field very shortly. We're looking forward to a memorable evening's football. We hope you'll be right with us. Yes, we will be right with them in a game that, according to many of the commentators and many of the writers, is likely to be rough, tough and hard. And the Irish players, according to one account, have been training twice a day in a desperate attempt to match the Australians' fitness. Well, we've had some views already, in fact, about that. And uh, j just again, just very quickly, um, Brian, this idea, a desperate bid, that was what one match commentator preview said about it. Do you think that that is really overstating it from a fitness point of view? I think it is, yeah, desperate bid. Uh, you know, there's no amount of training that uh, the group could have done since they arrived at Australia that would have increased their level of fitness dramatically you know the hard work had to be done here before they went yeah. now it's just uh, conditioning themselves to the climate to the type of game they're going to play and uh, in improving their uh, skill at the comp compromise rule games but I mean there will n there's no way it can be a dramatic if anything right. rest 
would be the best thing for them between since they arrived in Australia now and just yeah. some sharpening up of uh, reactions and things well, like I that. Well, I imagine, and you will know this very well, I imagine that Heffer would have taken great pains to make sure that they're as fit as his regime could possibly make them. Um, Seamus, a word on style as far as uh, the officiating is concerned. They are the Australians, I mean, they have very dramatic moves, this bounce of the ball that they have with the knee up and all this kind of thing. Do you think that sometimes style takes over from effectiveness? Well, uh, <clears throat> I don't think style enters too much into the Australian game at all. I think it's a, a physical strength uh, is a big feature of the game. I, 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 comparing the two games uh, before we had compromise rules, I would say there's a higher degree of skill in Gaelic football. Uh, the Australian game uh, tends to be more physical. Mm. Now, it's going to be interesting today to see what way this game will go and mm. what way the reaction of the Irish referee in particular, that's uh, a facet which I as a referee will be looking to uh, judge on yeah. because, um, you know, it's going to be, that, that is a very interesting point because uh, I have watched these games uh, yeah. on that you have shown and uh, I've seen one uh, particular match where there was a, the commentator described it, there's a jolly old dust up in the middle of the field and <laughs> and and the referee has taken no action and rightly so, this is what the fans have come to see. Now I don't think that would be allowable or tolerable in in, in, in the game in we're Croke about Park. to see. Oh in Croke Park. I or mean, or yeah, even in the yeah. game we're about to see because well, we don't want to wind up in the shambles that we had in Cork uh, in 84. Right. Well, there'll be a lot of eyes on it, both out there and here. We're going across to join them now, and gentlemen, I'm sure, well, Brian, you haven't actually got a pen and paper ready yet, but we'll provide you with one of those. Seamus, you've come well equipped, and we're going to be well equipped with pictures now as we go straight across to Australia for what should be, at the very least, an intriguing tussle. Let's join our commentary team in Australia. And you're very welcome back to the Wacker Stadium here in Perth. Perth, 7.30 p.m. Saturday night. And this magnificent stadium, as you can see, with a crowd at the moment of about eight, 9,000 constantly uh, filling up, uh, a little bit below expectations just at the moment. We're awaiting the entry of the two teams into this magnificent ground, which is being refurbished at a cost in excess of 10 million Australian dollars. The superb lighting system that you see here cost uh, in excess of $4 million. And last night, it was on for the first time involved for a big match here a cricket game involving western australia and victoria and indeed you can just uh, get a glimpse there of the wicket which is right in the center of the green the surface is absolutely ideal and with me to enjoy what we hope will be the first international between ireland and australia down under i've got Mihola Murhertig and also from australia although a man with a very Cork and Irish accent, John Hayes. A welcome to both of them. Michal Tafoyderot, what kind of a game are you anticipating? Well, judging by the game at Bunbury, uh, Bunbury last Tuesday night, it should be a high-scoring game. I would ex expect the score to reach the 60s, if not even the 70s, bearing in mind, of course, that a goal is worth six points. Our traditional point will be rated as three and a behind, which is a point going between the outer posts. So I would expect a high-scoring game very, very fast. That's what the locals here have been talking about all the week, how fast the warm-up game was. So it could be anybody's game. The Australians rated a better team than they had in 1984. They're expected to win, but then Ireland are very, very well prepared by Kevin Heffern and Liam Salmon for this game. We're hoping that Ireland will finish ahead, Joe. John Hayes, a local broadcaster, but you were born, I think, in Ireland, in Cork. What are your expectations, John? Yes, that's right, Joe, and I'm uh, very proud of the fact that I was born in County Cork as well and let all the locals know about it. But, yes, the, for two years ago, the, um, the, the, the competition was very rough and tough, but John Todd has changed his tactics somewhat, and as Mihal said, it'll be pace will be the name of the game today as we see the Irish lads coming out now, I think. So a very historic occasion then as the Ireland team playing their first match as an international side down here in Perth, the capital of Western Australia. A magnificent occasion indeed. And the Australians, led by Terry Danaher, who was one of nine Australians figuring in the team tonight to have played in Ireland two years ago. As he leads his side out there, the familiar figure you saw running out there just behind Terry Danaher was Morris Rioli. And here's John Platten. You remember him from Croke Park as well. And 
This is a bit strange because the Australians usually go on a lap of honour, as it were, to warm themselves up. The Ireland players here, Tom Spillane, who's been busily preparing here for the last nine days with uh, Joe McNally here, whom we expect to be playing at full forward, although positions will mean very, very little, as you'll see, once the game gets underway. And the Australians going across now to get into their familiar limbering up pattern. And uh, they'll lap around that ground and uh, soak up the atmosphere. There's a lot of Irish support here. Everywhere one goes, there are Irish people and those with Irish sounding names. And uh, Kevin Heffernan's team tonight won't lack for support. As well as this, there are about 200 supporters who've made the journey to Perth in what's probably a once in a lifetime trip for most. Let's go down now and hear the views of John Todd. It's where we can win this game, at ground level. We have an excellent number of players that can be interchanged all through all lines, and I believe that that will be our strength. Hopefully that, uh, you know, the rain doesn't settle in, and uh, I think we're in for an excellent night of football. John, in Ireland, the last series, they said that you're a little bit too physical. What's the instructions tonight? How are you going to play the game? We'll be playing the ball at all times, and I believe that if you play the ball determinedly and you hit the ball hard, you naturally become physical. Thanks very much, John. All the very best. And back to you, Dennis, in the commentary box. Well, it's back to Jerry. In fact, <laughs> Dennis next door, of course. Uh, Dennis Committee of Channel 7. They're broadcasting the match live all over Australia. And indeed, a great deal of attention being centred on Perth tonight. Everyone hoping and, of course, wishing that uh, this international series will be a success. That's Peter Wilson, by the way, there. Meanwhile, the Irish, having taken a lesson, perhaps, from the Australians, now preparing quite properly. Jack O'Shea there, the team captain, encouraging and urging his men on. Here's Kevin Heffernan. The Ireland side himself, a former star player and coach of four All-Ireland winning Dublin sides. Kevin, welcome to Western Australia. Thank you very much. How have the boys been training? Well, we've been training very hard. We've prepared very assiduously for this game and we're looking forward to a good battle and please God we'll win it. <laughs> Kevin, what can we expect from the Irish side? What, what are the strengths and what have you been concentrating on in your training? Well, I think our kicking ability is probably our greatest strength and uh, we'll be moving the ball pretty fast, we hope. And if uh, the strains of Molly Malone, which are here behind me, are anything to go by, we'll be giving it all we can. And the side is confident in success and they've been training well? We've been training well. We're ready for a battle and we're hoping for the best. Kevin, thanks very much for speaking with very us well. this evening and good luck. Thanks very much. Back to you, Dennis. Kevin Heffernan then in very good voice, very good humour. Indeed, there's been a great spirit among the Irish players. They really have been model ambassadors. And, of course, they've been in an unusual position in the last nine days because usually when they go on all-star trips, which is a comparable trip to this one, it's very much a holiday in the best possible sense. But here they've had to live and train like professional athletes without receiving any remuneration. So you may have lost pictures just for a moment. The team is still limbering up. And the officials tonight, as Kevin Heffernan moves off towards his bench, which is on this near side of the ground, Paddy Collins from Westmead, the familiar figure to Gaelic Games fans, and Rowan Soares, who will be remembered from the last series played in Ireland in 1984. Paddy Collins there wanting things to get underway fairly quickly. The match time to start at 7.45 local time. That's 1.40 or 12.45 uh, Irish time. Indeed, there had been a doubt about Paddy Collins before this match because of a leg injury. He's been receiving treatment four times a day from the Irish physio, Amy Johnson, and only passed himself fit to play here this morning. The other Irish official, of course, is PJ McGrath. And there is a nice little touch of Australia. There's been a great welcome for everyone down here, of course, from all the Aussies and everyone hoping for the best. So let's now take a check on the two teams. We'll start with Ireland and John O'Leary is in goal, of course. And what a curious full back line. Niall Cahalan of Cork, of Brian McGilligan of Derry and Kieran Murray of Monaghan. The half line features Dublin's Mick Holden and Jerry Hargan with Wicklow's Pat O'Byrne in the centre. He was a big success down in Bunbury. Tom Spillane and Jack O'Shea are placed at midfield, while the forward line shows Val Daly at centre-half forward, Joe McNally at full, and the Cork duo John O'Driscoll and Jimmy Carrigan in the corners. And there is Dermot McNichol. The first thing I suppose to be said about the team is that positions as we know them in Gaelic football will mean very, very little indeed 
both Niall Cahalan and Kieran Murray are expected to follow their men out the field, while Dubliners Holden and Hargan are expected to figure prominently in defence. We can tell you very briefly as regards the Australian team that John Todd has sprung a surprise or two by leaving Dermot Brereton and Gary Buccanaro off his side. Both uh, coaches, incidentally, uh, gave us just a list of 19 players because they're trying to emphasize this new game where there is constant interchange of positions and where players come on and come off at will, as in the game of basketball. And so the players now lining up on that uh, far side of the field for the respective national anthems. The Irish side captained by Jack O'Shea. The local papers have been featuring Jack quite prominently during the week as they build up the hype for the game. They talked about him being a living legend. I was Anish Shahogov, Auron Lavia. it is to hear the strains of the national anthem the Irish anthem here in Perth which is the capital of Western Australia a city of one million people and now we'll hear the Australian anthem And that kangaroo, at least, was showing the fighting spirit. Mihal, when the teams played two years ago, there was an awful lot of fighting spirit. What about the Irish team that Kevin Heffernan has selected tonight? It seems a good team. Lots of very, very skillful players. I think Kevin is relying on the skill and the speed with which the Irish players will move the ball to out with the Australians tonight. I don't think he was serious down at Bur Bunbury in that game. He wasn't one bit worried who won that game. Every, all cards are on the table tonight. What's interesting, really, the four players that will not be on the starting 15, Colm O'Rourke, Pat Spillane, Mickey Fagan of Westmeath, they're three very high-class players, they won't be on the field, but we can expect them, and Mick Lyons of Meath, to make very, very early appearances. In fact, we're told that within five minutes of the start, one of those four is to be introduced. Who it will be will depend on how the game is flowing that early. Of course, getting information from either of the coaches is trying to get, it's like trying to get the keys to the Kremlin, I think. John, we don't even know at this stage what 15 the Australians will start with. We know there are 19 players in all, but we haven't a notion, apart from the fact that Gary McIntosh is going to play in goal. Well, John Todd in, in Australian football is uh, known for that. He doesn't like the opposition to know the team that he's starting with at any given time. But I can assure people that uh, this is the pick of Australian footballers in season 1986. And John Todd's gone, worked very hard to make sure that he has a speedy team. He wants the ball to be kept predominantly on the ground. And he's going to work the players very hard. And I'm sure that you'll see a lot of interchange players going on during the course of the game. 
So the Irish at least going back into their positions. You won't quite notice it from the television angle, but there's a gradual incline from the boundaries of the pitch right up to the center where the rest of the week you'd expect to find cricket being played here. That's Pat O'Byrne there. And he's going to have a, bez a busy evening's work as we just try to see where they have eventually sorted themselves out to. Ireland will play from right to left in the first half. And there's a gentle breeze blowing into John O'Leary's face in the first half. There's the big dipper, Robert Deepier Dominico. Rowan Soares, one of the two umpires, getting the match underway. And straight away it's Jack O'Shea. Leaving the ball behind him, Chris Langford for Australia, downfield. And Kieran Murray beaten off at that time. It comes down to Kevin Walsh, the Essendon player. Seemed to be fouled that time. Very near the sideline. In fact, the ball gone out over the sideline. Kevin Walsh, you'll have heard me mention there, the full forward, the Essendon player, a player with an Irish background. His uh, father, I think, comes from Kilkenny, and the mother comes from Wexford. Meanwhile, Gary Pert is ready to take the line ball. Kicking it from the hands, as you'll notice, because it's permissible in this game to take frees such as that from the hands or from the feet on the ground as the first three-pointer goes to Australia's Chris Morris. Langford. Chris Langford it was. Chris Langford then the scorer of the opening three points. One red flag for a three-point that's over the bar as in Gaelic football. And there'll be two red flags for any goals that may come. John O'Leary who played in the last series in Ireland Indeed, in that last series, Ireland scored something like 12 goals. The Australians could only manage four from the three internationals. Here's Jack O'Shea, rounding Dipio Domenico as the play continues. And a push in the back, surely, that time. Dipio Domenico, the player involved in it. it. Seemed that Jimmy Kerrigan was the player who was fouled. The Irish players, you'll notice, wearing short sleeve shirts because the shirt is a target. You can actually catch the man by the shirt. Val Daly, once again, the referee, has the whistle blown. Rowan Soares on this half of the field. Of course, there are two officials in charge, both of them taking charge of a particular half of the field. Pat O'Byrne fists that one down. And Niall Cahalan getting involved in a little altercation there with John Platten. The line ball taken from the hands. This is the period in the game where they more or less sort one another out as Val Daly punts that one forward. Dermot McNichol trying to hold on to it. It's uh, Joe McNally who gets it across to Jack O'Shea as Ireland come looking for their first score. Jimmy Kerrigan under it. The surface is perhaps the best surface they'll have ever played on. It's in absolutely immaculate condition. Chris Langford, long, long ball down towards John Platten. Marvellous mark taken that time by Nal Cahalan. Any high catch like that, indeed any catch made from a distance of 20 metres or more is regarded as a mark. And immediately you have the option of a free such as that one. Ireland on the attack. John O'Driscoll so near to being the opening goal. He'll have to settle for one point instead. But Ireland's only attack, indeed the best attack of the game so far. So Ireland's first score goes to the young Corkman. He's only 19. He's the youngest player playing in this match. And a nice mark taken. And you already will see that the ground is fairly slippery. That's Paul Roos. Gary Perth trying a long one. And some... Very accurate shooting as that one goes over for Australia's second three-pointer. So that's six points the Aussies have scored in the opening four minutes. Some very accurate shooting indeed. Val Daly playing very deep. The Australians applying pressure early and often. The Irish players trying to get the ball away very fast. Here's Dipio Domenico, a fist thrown out that time. 
and another very high charge. The referee this time quite sensibly whistles back the play. There were two fouls that time on Tipio Domenico. There's the first one made by Joe McNally. Interesting to note here, Joe, particularly early in the game, that Robert Dippier Domenico is the only one that's using a lot of strength. Most of the Australian players are playing the ball. So the Australians take the mark. That's the captain, Terry Danaher. Very high punt forward, dangerously down into the Irish square. Morris Rioli was saved by John O'Leary. But it goes over the bar for a third three-pointer, a third over for Australia. Rioli very much in the thick of the action. Michal, the Irish team already in the battle, as it were, right in there and taking it on the chest. And the strange thing about the Australians so far, far how accurate they are in their kicking. They've had three attempts at overs or points in our game. They've got all three. As Niall Cahale, Cahalan takes it upfield. Jack O'Shea fisting it on towards Greg Blaney. And there was a late foul that time. Late foul by Terry Danaher for Australia. The referee has given it as a, a free to Australia to Terry Danaher. Swinging it across field. Peter Wilson here, a very determined player, down towards the left corner. Jerry Hargan back there for Ireland and giving away what it seems like uh, a line ball. So, in fact, it was over the end line, 45 then to Australia, the first in the match so far. That's Jared Healy. And again, you see the rather strange move of taking a 45 from the hands. A lovely mark, brilliantly taken in there by Chris Langford. And already he's been mentioned a few times in this game, very tall, very accurate. Look at this for a good catch, despite the attentions of Tom Spillar. One of the strongest men in Australian football. He's the fullback with Hawthorne, played in the grand final two weeks ago, and here he kicks, and yet another three-pointer. So from their four attacks so far, Australia has scored 12 points. Good fist forward that time by Wilson. Greg Anderson kicking in with the left boot. What marvellous finishing this is. But the referee this time saw a foul in any case as Anderson was going through. And it's going to be a free out for Ireland to take a little bit of pressure off their goal. The pressure stays on, however, with that bad kick away. This is the most marvellous bit of football that Australia have shown for quite some time. And Rioli, his time, has to settle for one point. I think, Michal, we could safely say that they, they never played as well as this when they were in Ireland. And we've just seven and a half minutes gone, and they've amassed a total of 14 points. Interesting that a lot of the Australians are loose as they go forward. The Irish players not marking up. McColden away to Jack O'Shea, the team captain. Can he now inspire his side as it goes to Greg Blaney? Back to Jack O'Shea. He'll be very tightly marked. It's quite plain to me that the, uh, the Australians have already identified three or four real danger men as Jack O'Shea has his jersey well and truly gripped. Peter Wilson quite incensed with that because he's been told beforehand that you can grip the player by the jersey. So, for his protests, he becomes the first player to have his name taken. And deserved it as well for the way he carried on. As Ireland mount an attack with Joe McNally here, back intended for Greg Blaney, but playing the short stuff at this stage doesn't seem to be coming off. Jer, I'm sure you'll have noticed that the Australian team are hunting in packs. They've always got somebody to support them. Val Daly, the Galway man, looking for a score off target. Dipia Domenico makes the catch, makes the mark, opts to play on, which is entitled to do, by the way. You can slow play down if your team is under pressure and uh, take the mark and opt for a free out, as it were. Or you can play on, but you must play on immediately in this game. 
Tom Spillane. Looking for Dermot McNichol, who has to come reeling backwards to pick that one up, and there's pressure coming in immediately from Peter Wilson. Now, that's the jersey pull which is permitted. Val Daly. Strong challenge by John Platton. Mark Naley, number five, and the umpire on the far side signals that will be an Irish ball. The stands have filled up quite considerably, and it seems now that we've got a crowd of about 10 to 12,000. A little bit below expectations. They were hoping to have a crowd of about 20 for this opening international down in Australia. Niall Cahalan. Kicking towards Jack O'Shea over Dipio Domenico. It took a rather unusual hop that time. Jimmy Kerrigan kicking it into space. The mark is made quite easily by the Australians. Peter Ruse, or Paul Ruse. Here's the dipper, and another very good mark by Mike Richardson, and this time he decides to take his free kick at goal. He could have opted to play on. It's just outside that 20-metre line to the right of the goal. Mike Richardson, his side well in control, and a poor kick well palmed away by John O'Leary. And, of course, the interesting thing from a goalkeeper's point of view is we've watched that very heavy challenge on Kieran Murray. But the goalkeeper has to cover not alone the 6.5 metres of his own goal, but also the outside posts as well for loose shots such as that one. There's the move yet again, and you saw the Australians there challenging in packs, as John Hayes was saying earlier. Confirmation of the score, 14 points to one, 11 minutes into the first quarter. There are four quarters in all, with 20 minutes play permitted in each. Good high match mark, brilliantly taken by Joe McNally. Kicking down into space, a hopeful ball as the dipper fisted out that time and took Pat Spillane out of the game. Pat is just in the action in the last few minutes. Watch this yet again. Now that's not allowed. Pat Spillane is having his name taken as well. What did you make of that, John? Well, I think that uh, it's very hard for the Australian players to sort of get used to these uh, modified rules, but obviously the rules are laid down, and as I said earlier, the dipper seems to be the only one who really is an adherent to them, and Peter Wilson as well. In the main, most of the Australians are trying to use the ball to the advantage of their teammate. Craig Holden, one of two Holdens playing in this match, Mick Holden for Ireland, of course, Craig Holden for Australia. That's Kieran Murray, the Monaghan man, Paul Ruse is under it, so too Chris Langford. There was uh, pushing in any case. Free to Australia. And there's the cricket wicket that we spoke of. It's a very, very hard bit of ground. And if they come down there, they really will feel it. Paul Ruse with the free. Mark taken inside by Gary Pert. Trying to spread open the play on that far side. Chris Langford booting it through, intended for Morris Rioli. And another good mark, but he decides to play on. Tom Spillane in possession, and the referee whistles. Awards possession to Australia. Watch Langford coming in on this far side. Jack O'Shea back to clear the danger for Ireland. Pat Byrne taking it out up towards uh, Dermot McNichol. And here's Pat Spillane, so much expected from him. Greg Blaney, the Irish moving smartly at last. In towards Jimmy Kerrigan to Joe McNally. Can they get a goal? Yes! The goal counts! It was brilliant play by the Irish. Tremendous use of the ball from right down in defence, right up to where they got the first six-pointer of the game. Absolutely brilliant. Jimmy Kerrigan, who did so much to set up that one, which was initiated by Pat Spillane. Greg Blaney helped it on, and watch Kerrigan. Good vision. And McNally's permitted to do that. In certain circumstances, uh, a punched goal like that might not be allowed, but the ball was in flight. That's the important issue. And so, Australia lead by 14 points to seven. Michal. That's a sign of hope for Ireland because Kevin Heffernan anticipates that Ireland will get the bulk of their scores by scoring the six pointers. That's one of them. It's a great help. It certainly is. Australia coming back. And that was the number 20 mark, Bairstow. In 
indeed so wide are the goals in this contest that you'd really want to be on target in every seven of ten attacks that you make. And another rather wild kick, but it counts as one point off the boot of Kevin Walsh, the Essendon player. Originally, he was left out of the Australian panel because of personal reasons, but then he said he wanted to play for his country, and he did he pay his fare to get here to Perth. As we watch the number 16 that time, it was Gerard Healy, Jack O'Shea, Ireland now trying to lift their game and get themselves right back into it after a dreadful start. Their confidence really rocked and shattered by some marvellous shooting by the Australians from anything up to 35 metres out. McColden, up intended for Greg Blaney. The pitch here about, to well, it was meant to be 90 by 145 but I think uh, it's not quite 145 yards long a little bit shorter than that so the Australian captain keeping it in possession you're allowed to take six steps or two bounces with the ball that's Chris Langford driving it through for one point so the Australians taking their total along now to, I think it's uh, 17 points, 17 points to seven. And Ireland possibly a little bit lucky to be within 10 points of Australia at this stage because Australia have certainly dominated the position game up to now. Craig Holden, the Aussies keeping possession at all times. Gerard Healy driving it in dangerously and Australia has scored a goal. Was it inside the small square, however, as it was the tall Kevin Walsh who got possession? Yes, the goal doesn't count. So another let off that time for Ireland. Chris Langford maintaining the momentum of the attack. And a long effort from about 25, 30 metres out by Wayne Johnson brings in one point, a white flag raised for a behind. But everywhere, the Australians proving their dominance. Jerry Hargan, unusual to see him play, as it were, as a left half back. But uh, Kevin Heffernan was saying to me during the week that it's important to get into one's head the idea that everyone becomes an attacker when you get possession and becomes a defender when you lose possession. So positions in this game seem to mean very little. You pick up the nearest man to you. Chris Langford being picked up that time by Tom Spillane, but it gets across to Morris Rioli, steadying himself. And he's got a white flag, so another one point for Australia. The Australians having a lot of the play. Ireland, of course, playing against the wind in the first half, but they do seem to have lost a bit of their concentration. Here they come with Greg Blaney. Now, this was the move that got a goal a few minutes ago, but this time it fails to produce anything. Gary McIntosh will be remembered from his games in Ireland two years ago. And Dipio Domenico, the Hawthorne player who won a Brownlaw medal just a fortnight ago. A very wild kick away that time. The Brownlaw medal, incidentally, signified that he was the best and the fairest player here in Australia this year. A long punt forward down towards Kevin Walsh. This time he doesn't hold possession. That's uh, Brian McGilligan, the fullback for Ireland. Indeed, it's rather unusual to have Brian McGilligan there at fullback. He's more associated with centre forward or full forward with his native Derry. Terry Danaher kicking down towards Kevin Walsh again, trying to make the mark, not holding on to it. A wild kick away that time by uh, Brian Gilligan. 19 points to 7 we make the score at the moment. Australia the leaders and about a minute and a half to go to the end of the first quarter. And still the weakness in the Irish team is their failure to mark their opponents. Australia often move with two spare men, nobody picking them up. John Platten makes the mark. One was expecting indeed that the Irish would come storming out in the first quarter. That's a good mark taken nicely down there by... Terry Danaher. It's a fight breaking out. And a fight. And a real schmuzzle. Just look at this. 
Well, they say here in Australia that a grand final is nothing without a big flare-up like this or a Donnybrook in the opening ten minutes. Everyone's getting involved. It's going to be hard to control this. The competitive spirit of all the players out there has come to the fore. And uh, Dipper has made a run from his own end line back and run straight in at three Irish players in a row. Perhaps you saw some of them. But this is some of the thing that was seen in the first test at Cork two years ago, something that could ruin the future of this entire series. I think that one, once again, one has to remember that the competitive spirit of the Australians, they want to continue in the winning way that they had two years ago. And John Todd is very, very keen on this series to be won more convincingly than what it was in Ireland two years ago. And that's the competitive spirit coming out on the but boys. But John Hayes, nobody can excuse that type of play in any sport. Agreed, agreed. So the dust-up, as they call it, has calmed down. Let's hope now that the dipper, who was very much involved in it, and his colleagues, he's been booked. In fact, both officials have been very busy taking a whole load of names at this stage. I couldn't quite tell you how many players have been already booked in this game. I think during that altercation, Gary Pert and the Dipper had their names taken. The Dipper, by the way, has left the field. We're not quite sure whether he's been sent off or whether there's been an interchange. If a player is sent off, then he can't naturally regain or rejoin the action. And his team is reduced to 14 players for five minutes when they then can bring on... Uh, a substitute. It looks as if the Dipper has been sent off for that offence, but Australia will be back to full strength in five minutes. And this Pat Gordon, the Irish player, two and two. Yes, two players from each side have been sent off. Pat Gordon of Wicklow seems to have gone off the Irish team, and he hasn't been replaced. It's a pity that that should have caught coming close to the end of the first ball. We also noticed that Tom Spillane has left the action. I'm not quite sure if he's been sent off as well. I think he has. And Mick Lyons has gone on for Greg Blaney. Confirmation of the umpires or the referees. They've had a very busy time. We're it, into injury time. And it would appear that Tom Spillane has been sent off because Ireland had reduced temporarily to 13 players. And the so, Australian coach John Todd and the, and the chief selector Ted Whitten aren't very happy with the players who've come off the ground. So the two officials... Now look at the two coaches on the side here. The two coaches, two coaches getting right. involved. Kevin Heffernan and John Todd, if the cameras can pick them up, which they haven't managed to do so far. They're just having a little argument. As we understand it, having done a quick count, both sides down to 13 men. And that will last for five minutes. I think John Todd's reputation over here is very strong with Kevin Heffernan. It doesn't mean anything to him. He wants to win this game as well. Pat O'Byrne is very much in the wars as well. He's receiving attention off the field at the moment. John Todd there, who coaches Swan Districts here in Perth. And a man with a fiery reputation. So play will restart with a throw-in. We've now played 23 minutes of the quarter. Ireland hold possession. Kieran Murray belting it away, but uh, the Australians quickly regaining it. Chris Langford. So the match then living up to its... Uh, pre-match billing as it were the fireworks were expected and that's precisely what we've got Morris Rioli let's hope that uh, tempers will calm down considerably there's an awful lot of good football to be played by both these teams let's hope they'll produce it because for the good of the series I think that's what it needs that time we saw Terry Danaher and one of the Irish players Mick Lyons going right in there when there was no need whatsoever to do so and this is really disgraceful. Jared Healy was the Australian player involved. There's no way, really, you can excuse this kind of play. These players have got too much skill to be too premeditated, uh, worrying about, about uh, abusive stuff like that. Let's get on with the game. Jerry Hargan with the free. Dermot McNichol makes the mark. And we repeat, that's a catch made from a distance of 20 metres or more. And there's the Hooter signalling the end of the first quarter. And even then, Val Daly was clipped from behind as the half-time score reads Australia 19 points, four overs and seven behinds. Ireland seven points, one goal. That goal by Joe McNally 
and one solitary point as well. Not a particularly good first half from an Irish point of view, Michal. Not a good half, but it's a pity that it degenerated there in the closing five minutes of play. Australia, as John Hayes mentioned, were playing good football. They're capable of playing football. No need to resort to those tactics, but obviously the Ireland players retaliated. They're both down to 13, but they'll be resuming with 15 shots. Yes, we better just explain that again to our viewers in this composite game. When you lose a player when he's sent off, the team is reduced by that player for just a period of five minutes, and then they can replace them and go back to their full complement of 15. The interesting thing, of course, is that they both started with 19 players. They're now effectively down to 17, so it now becomes a 17-man game. Well, that schmuzzle, as we might say in Ireland, John, it's all part and parcel, of course, of the Australian game. Yes, it is, Jaron. It happens week in, week out here where coaches tell their players that um, if, a, if a schmozzle starts, it's everybody in so that nobody can uh, think that their, their fairies are such. They're strong men and they're out to win. The one thing I think that came out of that first quarter was the way the Australians have worked hard on using the ball. They used the ball particularly well. The one thing that disturbs me a little bit is that the Irishmen, they aren't spoiling the ball from behind by that when they, when I mean when they're going for a mark. No one seems to be trying to punch the ball out of their hands and that's what an Australian defender does. He doesn't allow the player just to mark the ball free without physical presence being applied and that's the strength of the Australian team at present. And as you said, Hall, they're being allowed to run on their own too often and the Irishmen are gonna have to pick them up. Otherwise, they, they are all capable of kicking this round ball 40 and 45 yards. And if they're not picked up, the scores could be quite quite uh, further apart in the next quarter. And they're willing to use the long kick once they come into their own attacking half. They lob them in around the Ireland goal. It's working, they're making good catches and their men are always ahead of the Irish players going for the high ball. You'll also notice that when they get the ball deep out into the corners, they centre the ball into the actual centre goal square rather than have a shot because Todd has worked very hard on that aspect of the game as well. So I wonder what uh, Kevin Heffernan and Liam Salmon, his assistant manager, Seamus McHugh there on the right, who is the official runner, player who can run onto the field at any stage to issue instructions to uh, replace the player. Essentially, he's not meant to coach, but uh, we saw that law being waived, I'm afraid, down in Bunbury on Tuesday, where, incidentally, there was an awful lot of very good play. So the start of the second quarter, just moments away, you're entitled to an interval of five minutes between the first quarter and the second. Heaven and the Irish coach had a lot to say to his players at quarter time. He said, for goodness sake, bring the ball in lower into the forward line. They're not picking up the Australian players in the middle of the ground, which is what they've got to do. Play football and forget about the rough stuff. What did uh, Toddy have to say, Grant? Well, Coach Todd was very pleased with the Australian side. He was very pleased with the way they were running. He said, forget about the physical stuff. Go and get the ball and play the skills. That was the name of the game. And he said, keep up the good work from the first quarter. Very pleased indeed he was. That's it from down here, fellas. Back to you. So there it is, the advice coming from the two coaches to their teams. So Ireland with an awful lot to do, playing with the breeze behind them for the second half, and straight away Mick Lyons is involved yet again with Morris Rioli. Rioli is one of the calmest players in Australian rules football, and again we have this dust-up, as they call it here. And again, it really is very, very unfortunate to see this happening. Straight in the very first international match, the second such incident we've had, and in case anybody's joined us late, we've already had four players sent off in the opening 20 minutes. And the referee here will have strong words with Mick Lyons of Ireland. Mick Lyons of Ireland, since he came on, he came on after the first, uh, after the first uh, incident, close to the end of the first half. He has been involved in that. But if this type of thing continues, is there any point in going on to Melbourne and playing a second game? I think it's detracting from the whole spectacle of the game. The spectacle spectacle of this game I can see just by looking around at the crowd that people have really been captured by this game and they don't really want to see this they want to see the skills that as, as I suggested earlier the Irishmen showed when they got their first six pointer and the Australians the way they used the ball and that's what they really have to get back to and I'm sure both coaches would have said that to their charges at uh, quarter time so play continues with Dale Whiteman, who's known as the flea over here. He's only five feet, six inches tall. Good mark by Jack O'Shea. He opts to continue with the play. Gets it back from Dermot McNichol. 
half block down and another very high challenge that time as Peter Wilson plays it onto the unmarked Morris Rioli this is a very nice bit of play by the Australians and a point was it yes Wayne Johnston kicking a three-pointer good start to the second quarter Jimmy Kerrigan there one of the Irish players out at the moment we should explain, of course, that there is constant interchange. You can bring on or bring off a player as you wish, and you can change around the players on your team as often as you wish. But now, because of the sending offs, both panels reduced to 17 players. This is Gerard Healy, a very good link man with his club. And missed completely that time by Mick Holden, but it goes through the post for one point. Again, the referee whistles, and he wants that kick-out taken yet again. John O'Leary is very, very quick with the kick-outs. On occasions when he see, uh, sees attacks mounting, he's already behind looking for a spare ball to take the kick-out. This time punting it hopefully forward, but the... Irish hopelessly out of touch at the moment. Strong challenge by Mick Holden there on Mark Bairstow. Greg Blaney getting in his kick. A nice mark, brilliantly taken by Healy. There's an awful lot of fluency in the game. It's a very fast game. Let's hope that as a sporting contest, it will continue in the best possible sense. Just watch that mark yet again. That's Mike Richardson. Place for Essendon, as you see, and the VFL. The VFL, very much the Premier League here in Australia. Kicking that ball through, but hopelessly putting it wide. Indeed, the football here in Australia is bound for a revolutionary change as teams like Perth are about to be introduced into it next year. And that's a very big change because up to now it's been basically dominated by the teams from Victoria. Peter Wilson full of determination, driving it forward for Greg Anderson. That's Brian McGilligan who doesn't take any prisoners. He's impressed everyone out here. They're already calling him the Hulk. Paul Ruse makes the catch, the mark. That's knocked on by Wayne Johnson. Craig Holden. Here's the flea, Dale Whiteman, looking for a three-point score maybe. Playing it back to uh, number 23, Wayne Johnson. John Platten this time accepts the mark, which he's entitled to do. He could have opted to play on that time if he thought it would be to the advantage of his team. Instead, he decides to slow it down and have a shot at goal. Well, he might as well have played on because he's missed it completely. But the Australians still in a very prominent position. Mick Lyons again having some words down there with Mark Bairstow. The Australians leading by 23 points to seven. That's the position into the second quarter. We're five minutes into that quarter now. Craig Holden. Up towards Greg Anderson. Gets there ahead of Brian McGilligan. Doesn't seem to throw out the fist as well. He was impressive in Bunbury. The danger's still there. And the Australians will have to settle for just one point. That's the Irish bench. Many worried expressions there, as you saw. Niall Cahalan fisting it wide towards Pat Spillane. Strange to see him wearing number seven. Dropping it forward towards Joe McNally. On towards Colm O'Rourke, swung around that time. There can be no question about that. That's Irish possession, surely. Colm O'Rourke now becomes a very vital member of this team with the two sending offs earlier in the game. So a good opportunity for a three-point score for Colm O'Rourke because, of course, the player who is fouled, he's the player who must take the free. And I think Pat Spillane that time was hoping that he might be able to take it. Colm O'Rourke usually very accurate, and that's a three-pointer for Ireland, and over, which takes their score along to ten points. So I wonder what the tactic will be now. Will they change from the shorter game that Ireland was adopting earlier on and try to punt it in for players like Colm O'Rourke or Joe McNally or maybe even Pat Spillane to get possession? Greg Blaney applies the pressure. That's Gerard Healy. 
Mark Bairstow, leaving it behind for McLeans. He was quickly swallowed up, but managed to get it out to Mick Holden. And a good mark called, claimed and got by Pat Spillane. In towards Greg Blaney. Greg outmarked. Paul Ruse takes it for Australia. And again, Colm O'Rourke, the player involved this time. And when have you ever seen Colm O'Rourke involved in a little battle like that? Usually one of the calmest players on and off a football field. But Paul Ruse simply came out of him that time. And O'Rourke was swallowed up in the resultant fight. Definitely started by the Australian side that time. Paul Ruse didn't like what had happened to him and he started that. That's Ted Whitten there on this boundary line. And he looks very concerned at this stage of the way this game's been played because Ted Whitten, a legendary man in Australia, called Mr Football, was a total skill player. We have to say, of course, that both these sides were really worked up before this match for two very good reasons. The two coaches really wanted to win it. Kevin Heffernan was saying he badly wanted to win it. And, of course, we all know John Todd's competitive nature. So maybe it's uh, seeping through to the players, but I'm sure they could never, either coach, really wanted this kind of a result. Healy for Australia towards Rioli. And it slips by Mick Fagan, who's in the match, the Westmeath player. Rowan Soros here, one of the youngest officials in Australia, and issuing the orders. Morris Rioli with a free, dropping it across towards Chris Langford's side. Langford looking dangerous, kicking high, but kicking wide of that left-hand post which was an incredible miss because he was terribly close to the line that time. Pat Spillan kicking it wide across towards Joe McNally's side. Good mark. It's Dermot McNichol indeed. McNichol opts to play on. Inside towards Colm O'Rourke racing across for it. Paul Ruse is the defender. And a bad Irish miss at the other end. The shooting in this quarter so far, Michal, not at all as good as we witnessed in the opening 20 minutes. Not up to the standard we had during the opening 20 or the opening half of that first 20 minutes. But uh, they're beginning to concentrate on the ball again, which is a good sign for the second half of the game. Ger, I think one thing that uh, I've noticed so far is the fact that uh, Jack O'Shea, the captain of the Irish side, seems to be in defence more often than what he was a couple of years ago in Ireland. Is that uh, something that ha happens on a regular basis? Well, Jack, of course, has a great habit of playing just about anywhere. You can very often see him popping up in defence, but, uh, well, he's more noted as an attacking midfield player. But he does do his share of work, as we all know, back in defence as well. Perhaps it's an indication of the pressure that Australia are exerting so far. Right now, Australia has possession with uh, Mark Naley next to the cricket wicket. Beautiful night, by the way, here in Perth. Just a gentle breeze blowing behind Ireland for this second quarter as McFagan lets it behind him. Kieran Murray goes back there to retrieve it. That's Brian McGilligan under intense pressure. The Irish team unable to settle on the ball. That's the Australian tactic, as you see, attacking in packs. Four players that time, trying to intimidate Jack O'Shea. So Jack back there on his own 13-metre line. So the whole future of this experiment, as it were, really in doubt at the moment. Can the Irish get back into the game? And can the game itself salvage something of its reputation? That's the, the good part of its reputation from the last series. And again, it's Terry Danaher and Colm O'Rourke. And the Irish look good for a goal, and it's another goal. Another goal for Ireland. The two flags waved, and it's McNichol who gets it. Dermot McNichol. From here, he seemed to be very near the small square, I must say. But uh, perhaps he was just running in. Perhaps he was just outside when he got connection. Another indication of the tremendous skill of the Irish players close in, and I'm sure all the Australians will now be very, very wary of, a, of the Irishmen when they get close in and they've got possession of the ball. And if they can continue to do that, I can assure you that the Australian players will go on defence. 
So 24 points to 16. It's the best possible thing that could happen to the game, and certainly from an Irish point of view, it bears out what we've been saying earlier, that Ireland's best hope of success from the series was to get six pointers, to get goals. That was the one tactic that seemed to be baffling the Australians last time around. They don't naturally, of course, have goals as we know them in their game. That's John O'Driscoll. We haven't seen too much of him so far. Jack O'Shea was swung around very high that time, and the referee, Paddy Collins, whistles back the play. The goal will not count. And I think that's strike. very unfair, that, because, I mean, the Irish players are trying to play to the rules to play on to the advantage, and it should have been allowed to keep going. Well, Paddy Collins wouldn't, wasn't aware at the time that it might develop. It was a definite head-high tackle on Jack O'Shea, but the ball was released, and under the compromise rules, the referee could have allowed play to continue. 23 points then to 16. We've made it 24 points. But uh, it's quite difficult from time to time to keep tabs on uh, the score here because, of course, you get so many scores. That's a wide point from that shot by Jack O'Shea. In our game, that would have been wide in Gaelic football. But uh, it counts as a very valuable point here in Perth this evening. Jerry Hargan, bottled up by two players. One of them there, Tony McGuinness. The other was uh, Craig Holden. Jerry Cargan then to Mick Holden. Down towards Dermot McNichol, the scorer of Ireland's second goal in this first opening international match. Peter Wilson. And a very good mark taken and claimed by Mick Lyons. Joe McNally wanted a shorter, quicker ball instead. McLean's has opted to hold, kick it down deep, which might just well come off. And Ireland's got a third goal. It's Joe McNally who gets his own second, the game's third. And what a big boost that is now for the Irish contingent and for the Irish team down here in Australia. Just watch the replay. It came from that long punt forward from the mark by McLean's. A bad bit of fielding by Paul Ruse. Touched on that time by Colm O'Rourke and McNally claims his second goal. So that's the position. The scores are level according to the official scoreboard here. On our tally, the Australians are still a point ahead. The Australia are still a point ahead by my reckoning, but then the scores are coming so frequently that it's difficult to know. But I would say that the Australians are ahead. The 24-23 is the correct score. Frankly, I prefer the score that we had here on the screen. <laughs> Ger, I think that's just what this game needed for it to be all tied up. So, the Irish coming good. And a disappointed Dermot McNichol throwing the ball away that time as a foul was committed. The tackle still causing many problems down there. You're allowed to grip your opponent, but it's pretty hard to define what a grip is in the thick of the action. That's certainly not permitted. That's Niall Cahalan, one of the bravest performers on the field. Went off with an injury in Bunbury on Tuesday. Punting it down, intended for Pat Spillan. Paul Ruse comes, claims it. The centre-half back. On towards Craig Holden, very near the far sideline. Indeed, the referee's whistle has gone. Positions, as we said before, virtually impossible to define down here. It's such a fluent game of football. Everyone becomes an attacker, and when you're under pressure, everyone becomes a defender. As a result, it all looks a bit confused from time to time. John Platten heard a whistle as I think he stepped out over the far sideline. The unmistakable figure of John Platten. One of the highest paid players, by the way, in Australian rules football. He would be getting earning something of the order of 40 to 50,000 Irish pounds. That's because last season he joined Hawthorne and as such was in a position to negotiate a very good deal for himself. And, and we've, we've just confirmed that the correct score is Australia 24 points, Ireland 23. So the Australians in a one point leading position. 15 minutes of this uh, second quarter. Completed, Morris Rioli touching it on the referee, allowing an advantage, which comes to Greg Anderson, badly kicking it across, but it might come good yet. Here's Platten, chance of a score, maybe a goal. Bottled up by the Irish cover, McGilligan punching, but it's a goal to Greg Anderson for Australia. 
Number 19, Greg Anderson, who this year won the Magaray medal winner for South Australia, where he was rated the top player in the game, gives Australia another encouraging score. Watch how it came with Platten, bottled up initially by the cover, with Pat Byrne and Val Daly very much involved. And there was the fist into the corner of the goal. Behold, that was very bad play by the goalkeeper then, when there were so many Irishmen around that could have gone to the oncoming Anderson. The goalkeeper should have stayed in goal for mine. Yes, and uh, possibly good use by the referee of the advantage rule there. Even though an Australian player had been fouled, he waved play on. That's allowed according to the rules. A good decision by the referee in fairness to him. It certainly added to the fluency of at that time, and it was to Australia's advantage. Tony McGuinness punting it forward for Greg Anderson. The goal scorer, he also scored one of the goals, by the way, in Bunbury, kicking and kicking outside. He's got a behind, which means he's got another point. So in the space of a minute, Greg Anderson for Australia, the number 19, has scored seven points, a goal and a behind for his team. And once again, the Australians taking the initiative. That's Jared Healy playing it wide out towards John Platten. Val Daly, the number six. Kieran Murray, number five for Ireland. That's Mark Naley. Across towards Terry Danaher as Jack O'Shea lets it go out over the end line. I was about to say shepherded it out over the end line, but here in Australia they understand a totally different meaning to the word shepherding. It's a, a form of our third man tackle. So the Irish now lifting the siege. Pat Spillane pulled around by the jersey, which uh, is very permissible. That's indeed why the Irish have opted to wear short sleeves. Peter Wilson, this looks very promising. A good kick and a three-point score. That's Peter Wilson, the scorer, pushing Australia's lead ahead. They now lead by 34 points to 23. So 11 points between the sides, two minutes to go to the end of this second quarter. John Platten, good mark by him. Again, sensibly deciding to slow the game down. Pat Spillan needs a new jersey. Well, Platten has put it wide. And Pat Spillan's jersey in that last incident there, you may remember, well and truly tested. The material apparently found wanting. An all-Australian team of... Uh, Officials, except for Paddy Collins, of course, all the linesmen as we would know them, and the various umpires are Australian. There's Seamus McHugh, the Irish runner. Jared Healy will have to go outside the, uh, the boundary, as it were, to take this sideline kick. Brian McGilligan was pushing his opponent, the umpire Rowan Soares decides. And he's awarded a free in to Australia, which will be taken by number 12, Terry Danner. The team captain then from the 20-meter line, that's the angle, should be a three-pointer. Yes, he gets it. Just about, I would think, it seemed to swing in. John well, O'Leary doesn't a, agree. A curious thing there, one of the umpires waved the white flag, the other waved one red. One red signifies three, one white signifies one. I think the one is going to predominate. Well, the white, the white flag waiver was the best, best uh, official in the, in the best uh, position to adjudicate. So it's a white flag, then one point rather than three. Colm O'Rourke racing onto this loose ball. Jack O'Shea well up there with him, galloping forward in towards Joe McNally. Across towards John O'Driscoll. Can Ireland get another goal? Oh. Yes, that's a brilliant score. It's brought the bench to its feet. Tom Spillane can look around and admire John O'Driscoll's marvellous skills. What a brilliant move it was, involving five players. Jack O'Shea, the second to be involved. Then the pass coming across to John O'Driscoll. Wham! Into the back of the net. So, the position now. Ireland, 29 points. Australia, 35. So, just a goal between the sides by our reckoning. And we're a minute into injury time or delayed time in this second quarter. So coming up to half time in the match, Greg Anderson back towards Morris Rioli as Mick Fagan applies the pressure. Here's John O'Driscoll. What a lovely goal that was. Chris Langford stems the tide. 
Craig Holden up to Peter Wilson. Now he'll run the six paces he's entitled to do. He can hop it again and run another six. Uh, this time the referee saw something wrong with that. Travelling, travelling, he ran too far, I think, Joe. Well, there was a degree of confusion about just how far you could run, and uh, by our reckoning, you were allowed to run six steps initially. You could then hop the ball and run another six. I think that's what Peter Wilson thought that he was doing. I think he took a few more than six the second time. <laughs> Jerry Hargan's long ball. Good mark taken down there. Healy. Mark Bairstow, and there's the hooter, signalling the end of... The first half of the match, a first half which was very eventful from an Irish point of view. There's still some work for Jack O'Shea's team to do. That's the half-time position, Australia 34. Ireland with four marvellous goals, 29 points. So, a lot to talk about, Hall at half-time. Yes, a good second quarter there for the Ireland team. The score at the end of the first quarter was 19 for Australia and 7 for Ireland. At one stage, mid through the second quarter, it read 24 to 23. Ireland came back, but then Australia had another period of about five minutes in which they dominated. But it's a good sign of the Irish team that they finished the, uh, finished the better of the two teams during the closing five minutes there. John Hayes, you're not without hope for Australia either. Now, well, I think that the Australians, halfway through that particular quarter, lost the momentum of the game. And, and I think that the Irish's ability, particularly in close, when they used the balls um, short, they certainly seem to play this game a lot better. Trying to play the long game doesn't seem to be the Irish's best attack. And if they use the ball properly and get it in close, they are more capable of the Australians in scoring goals, as we've seen already. So the lights then here in Perth tonight providing plenty of illumination, a lot of electricity as well. Halftime score, Australia 35, Ireland 29. We'll be back shortly. Meanwhile, let's go back to Liam Nolan. Jared Canning down there in Australia, thank you very much indeed. Interesting to see that score. In fact, 34-29, just uh, five points in it between them. To think that Australia at one stage led 14-1, they also led 19-7. So, as I say, much more respectable-looking score. But a lot of turmoil, a lot of punches, a lot of macho stuff, and a lot of reason for a lot of comment. We'll take a short break now. Stay with us, and when we come back, we'll have the views of our panel and also some inserts. <laughs> Hello again. Well, if you were with us right from the beginning of the program, you'll have seen a tumultuous first half in the international at uh, compromise rules down in Australia between the Ireland Touring, touring Party and Australia. And the comments here in the studio, in fact, were very illuminating in themselves, and uh, none more vehemently than those of uh, Brian Mullen. Brian, earlier on, you were, in fact, expressing dismay at some of the attitudes of the Irish players, perhaps in the attack and the release of the ball. Would you go back over some of those? Uh, well, I was just uh, surprised that it took the Irish uh, so long to uh, settle into the game, to the, the way it was supposed to be played. And still, they haven't settled into it for a long enough period of time, as far as I'm concerned, as regards um, tackling the Australians the right way, the way they're allowed. It's a different tackle than they're allowed in Gaelic games, and, and they don't seem to have caught on to it yet. And the time that they played best in the second quarter was when they started grabbing hold of the Australians, the way the Australians have been grabbing hold of them. And that was the most surprising aspect for me. I felt they haven't settled in. And definitely also, they've uh, given away an awful lot of possession. I mean, every time the camera comes out to the middle of the field after a kick out from John O'Leary, there's an Australian man on the ball again. They don't seem to be coming to grips with getting the ball away from the fence quickly enough or properly enough at all. Let me so. turn to Seamus. What about the actual control of the game? And we'll see later on an incident. <coughs> but what about the control by the officials on the field? Yeah. Um that's interesting, Liam. Uh, the control was particularly interesting from my point of view as a referee uh, when the dust-up uh, came. Uh, you had the advantage of two referees going in to sort it out. Normally, each referee uh, referees in his own half, but when that uh, dust-up came, uh, you could see it wasn't in Paddy Collins' half of the field, but he was immediately in with his pen, noting <coughs> the... the the, the people at fault, and the, the, this was a good thing, but uh, I found the whole thing very sickening, uh, that particular thing. It, it's, it's, I don't see uh, it, it been a, having a role to play in our game, certainly. Okay, well, we're going to take a look at something, because, in fact, we did have an opportunity to see some uh, flowing football, but we also saw this particularly unedifying. 
uh, experience here. Now, what have you got to say about this, Seamus? Well, I was very uh, sorry for Thomas Balan been put off in that he appeared to be the, have the role of the peacemaker in it. But uh, I think Brian commented earlier in the studio, I, I think uh, Ireland came best out of that in that, that the dipper been put off seemed to be a factor in, in bringing Ireland more into the game. It would appear to me that, 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 that he was just a, a, a hatchet man, a, a, a part of an Australian ply, and since he's gone, the Australians don't appear to be as robust or as contesting the ball as much as the world. But this may be due to the fact, as Brian has said, that the Irish are beginning to, to tackle more. And, and it seems strange. We've had a lot of uh, complaints in this country about our tackle, but now when we had a, uh, a more defined tackle and more... Uh, 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 you know, where a player can really get in there and pull from the, as I said earlier, from the shoulder to the waist. The Irish, the Irish players don't seem to be doing this. Now, Colm O'Rourke is, and as a result of two tackles in particular by Colm O'Rourke, it did result in, in Ireland getting scores. Similarly, when the Australians got a goal, the failure of John O'Leary to, to uh, use the tackle was the reason for the, the goal being scored. So... Uh, I think the Irish want to get dug in, use this tackle, and they'll certainly come more into the match. Now, uh, the, the phrase, get dug in, Brian, as Seamus was just saying there, I think you were also uh, saying here earlier on that, in fact, Ireland seemed to be succumbing to what looked like deliberate intimidation. Uh, yeah, it's difficult enough to say. Only the people in the dressing room could answer that. But it seemed to me that in, in the art of, of winning possession in man-to-man -man situations, the Irish weren't uh, contesting it as much as they should have been or as strongly as they should have been. And uh, as I said earlier, it, it, every time we looked up, we seen a, see an Australian player on his own and getting a ball from possession that was kicked by an Irish player. Yeah. So either something was wrong, either the player that was supposed to be going for the ball didn't go for it, or else the player that was kicking it wasn't very accurate in his kicking. Let's take a look then at the uh, goal scored, the first goal scored by John McNally, your own teammate, and we've got uh, Pat Spillane in this. Perhaps you'll take us through this one here now. Yeah, it, any time the Irish moved the ball, it, it was uh, very, very much to their uh, uh, advantage, you know. Any time they got running with the ball and used it intentionally, looked up, took the steps that they're allowed to take and uh, played it intelligently. Like, uh, they seem to have a, a bit of, um, before this, a bit of uh, nervousness about carrying the ball the six steps and then it off. And actually, uh, that was a very well worked goal there and very well played by J Jimmy Kerrigan, although he got fouled off the ball after he hit it, which is, uh, again, seems to me that uh, you know the, the Australians are getting a bit away with more than they should be. Uh, I think that, they, I wouldn't like to do the Australians an injustice, but I think they're an arrogant, they're fairly arrogant, and they, they like hitting, but they don't like getting hit. And uh, the Irish would want to make sure that they, they don't, you know, allow it to, to go to the stage where they're, they're not going to be in with a chance at all. Because definitely they're not getting everything they should be from the referees. Yes. Now, you made the point that when the, the uh, dipper went off, that in fact things changed. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me turn to Seamus and ask if you were officiating at that. From anything that you saw from here at this distance, would you have sent him off before he was in fact sent off? Well, it's hard to say. It's hard to say in a studio. You, you don't get the same feel of it as you do out on the pitch. But there are certainly pay, players still on the field that should have been gone. Oh. But uh, an interesting rule that is in the compromise rules is when the the, the goal was scored, and uh, the Irish player was fouled by the goalkeeper who came out and flattened him. There is uh, in the compromise rules, which isn't in Gaelic games rules, that. Uh, the referee could have given a further free and still allowed the goal, and I think that is a good uh, yeah. facet of the new rules, but that wasn't Im implemented. Uh, I, I would like to add that that was by the Australian referee, not by Pat Collins. I mentioned earlier on that uh, parts of the uh, game were distinctly unedifying, and I think the punch-up scenes where a lot of people get involved in it uh, would warrant that particular description. What does that do to the ambitions that this game should spread and become international, which is what the Australians themselves are desperately hoping for and fearfully ambitious about? Can that help it? Well, uh, like uh, my view on that, quite simply, is that that is the a facet of the Australian game, and I, I, I've no doubt but Kevin Heffernan had this in mind when he selected the team to go out. Uh, a lot of the players uh, gone out had been known, Irish players, had been known as, as hard men of Gaelic football. Oh. But unfortunately they're not, uh, like, I don't mean hard men in the dirt sense, but hard men that did go in and get involved and wouldn't shirk, but they're certainly not going in today. 
and uh, I, I feel that they should be. And and this is the, when they do that, the Australians appear to get upset and 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 are claiming all sorts of things, looking at the referee and all this type of thing, and look at it, well, they can't understand it, but we're not getting enough of that from the Irish. Well, when they were working well, they really did work well. We have an example coming up now, in fact, how we had another uh, Irish goal. And Brian, again, perhaps you can take us through this with your comments on it. Yeah, it, uh, it's uh, at, during the period of the game when the Irish were playing well, and uh, moving the ball well and playing it the way we know they're capable of. Jack O'Shea takes a lot of steps here, he bounces it and gives the ball off quickly and the Irish have the extra men here. And it's a great goal by John O'Driscoll, very well taken. And that's, that's the kind of skill that we, we know we're capable of and which we should be using. And uh, just like to uh, comment on something that Seamus said there, she when Seamus talking about hard men and whatnot, he's just hoping we just just see it and replay first. Yeah, he's, just, delivering that pass. he's just hoping uh, that the Irish players will will win possession the way strongly, the way we know they're capable of. That yeah. they will hold on to it and that they will use it intelligently. Given that they have six steps, they're allowed to bounce. They don't have to solo. They can take six further steps. They can punch past it. There's another, and also the one thing they're not using is the mark. They're not using it at all. Uh, they're in situations where they're crowded around by Australian players. They're catching the ball and. They're getting freeze against them for, for being caught in possession. And I think that it basically going into the second half now, if I was talking to the players in the dressing room, I'd be saying that use the rules to their full advantage. Uh, think about what you're doing and we'll win this game no problem because we're playing with a round ball. If we get to moving it and playing football the way we can, we'll win this game. OK, very briefly, that's what you said you would say if you were talking to them. You know Kevin Heffernan's style, you know the way he talks. Is that what he is saying to them now in the dressing room? Uh, I would imagine so. I would say, uh, say that it's something along those lines. He, as, as somebody said on the television there, he, he said very strongly before the match that he was very eager to win this game. So, uh, uh, like, uh, I, I can't uh, echo his words because I can't hear them, but I would say that he's, he's saying something along those lines, that to, get, to win the match they have to play intelligently and they have to play football the way we know where they're capable of. Right, gentlemen, thank you both very much indeed for your comments there in that uh, at the end of the first half. We're going to go back now to Perth and uh, rejoin our commentary team down there and let's see whether that scoreline that says Australia 34, Ireland 29 will alter radically and end up in Ireland's favour. There you are, that's the crowd waiting for the second half to begin, so let's go back now and rejoin Jerk Henning. West, welcome back to the Western Australia Cricket Association's ground, the Wacker Stadium as it's known here on a pleasantly cool evening. After quite a warm day, temperatures all this week have been about 20 degrees Celsius and that will rise to over 30 and even over 40, would you believe, as the Australians get into their summer in December and January. It's been known indeed to reach a high here of 43, 44 degrees Celsius. There's the Prenderville stand. Named after a man of Irish extraction, as you'd imagine, indeed, his grandfather, I believe, came from uh, Castle Lyons in County Kerry. Castle Island in County That's Kerry. Right, yeah. Been away too long to even remember the Kerry towns at this stage, Mihal. The city, I think you'll agree, has a lovely, friendly, pleasant feel about it, hasn't it? Extremely nice. In most other cities, people say they're lovely to visit, but it's good to be going home. But lots of the people who've come here to Perth they say this is a place we wouldn't mind staying on for a long, long time and perhaps even living here. Lovely people, a lovely city, and uh, we've been told that the crowd is about 15,000 people. That's a great crowd considering we had a very, very big cricket game here last night and the crowd was 14,000. So a satisfactory attendance at this first international. Let's hope the football will be good for the second half. We did see some very good football during that first half. Both teams are capable of playing it. Let's hope they do it from now on. We were listening indeed to GA President Dr Mick Loftus in an interview at halftime here on Channel 7 in Australia and he was remarking there he was very satisfied with the first half but uh, upset of course by that uh, bit of violence we had in the first quarter in particular. So confirmation of the score at halftime, Australia 1-6-11, 35 points in all, Ireland 4 goals, just one over, very surprising indeed, and uh, two behinds giving them a total of 29. John, the physical aspect we've spoken about many, many times, do you think the game as we saw it there in the opening 40 minutes is attractive for these Australian spectators? 
Jer, I think that the Australian public, because of the nature of the Australian rules game, expect a little bit of physical contact. And I think that it's probably more to the liking of the Australian public than it would be to their Irish counterparts, because as I suggested, they do expect it. But by the same token, there is a lot of skill in our game, as there is in the Gaelic game. And I think that the Irish players in particular showed how skillful they can be, particularly in close to goal. I think that they've they've probably tried to play the long game too much because when they've reverted back to their normal short game, they have shown the West Australian public what they can do with the round ball, which is something that we would find very, very difficult to understand because with the oval ball, the ball goes from one end of the ground very quickly because it's kicked over distances of in excess of 50 metres every time it's kicked, unless, of course, there's a short pass on. But the game, I think... As, as, as already has been said by the number of people that have turned up, considering that we've also got the America's Cup in Western Australia, there's a lot of sporting activities on, and I think the public have got right behind this one. And you saw Jack O'Shea just a moment ago there, firing his charges. Kevin Heffernan joining the group as well now. The final team chat. The nation's reputation is at stake. There's John Todd, DP Domenico, one of two Australians dismissed in the first half, the other being Gary Pert. And in case you've joined us late here on Sports Stadium, Ireland down at one stage to 13 players when Pat Byrne of Wicklow and Tom Spillane of Kerry were dismissed. But because of the rules of this composite game, you can now revert to the normal 15-man game, having been penalised for about five minutes. We noticed that Jack O'Shea and Joe McNally are two of the players who have been substituted. They can come back into the action, of course, at any time at all. There's Pat Spillane, who had some influential runs in the course of the second quarter in particular. Ireland with four great goals so far, scored by Joe McNally, who got two of them. John O'Driscoll got the fourth, and the other goal was scored by Dermot McNichol. The big dipper there. And uh, Pat Spillane wearing Tom's jersey for the second half. I think his own jersey was torn there before half time, but he's now wearing the brother's jersey. And he's a player that I feel that would be a very successful Australian rules footballer, Pat Spillane, as well as obviously Jack O'Shea. The F there you see is painted into the ground representing a local brewery firm. That's Dermot Brereton. We may see him in the second international, but the second half of this first international series here in Australia starts. Australia leading by six points, or just a goal between the teams. According to the composite rules, you get six points for every goal that you score. And during that first half, Australia scored on 18 occasions, while Ireland had just seven scores, but four of those were goals. Pat Spillane, availing of the six steps that you can take in the composite game. Got two players slipping there on the cricket wicket. And it's Peter Wick, Peter Wilson, who drives it through towards Jared Healy. The attack looks good. This is Dale Whiteman, the flea. Good stop by John O'Leary as he's driven straight at him. And he narrowed the angle down. Australia then straight into the attack, starting this second half. And it would be interesting if we could count the number of steps the Australian took that time. It far exceeded the seven. He was at the six. He was travelling fast. Correct. Got away with it. That's a very good mark taken by Mick Fagan. Player, I suppose, who won't be that familiar to uh, followers of Gaelic games, even in Ireland, because uh, he comes from Westmeath and uh, doesn't always receive perhaps the, the attention that he should get. But uh, it's interesting that in this last series as well, uh, the games at, in Ireland threw up a number of players who wouldn't normally receive the kind of publicity going with international performance. That's a very good mark taken by the Australian captain, Terry Danaher in a dangerous position, a kickable position, the Essendon man then from about 30 metres out, looking for the opening score of the second half to Morris Rioli, who makes the mark before McFagan could push him, but the referee has decided to penalise McFagan for that push in the back on Morris Rioli, and so the mark will be taken from a more advantageous position if Morris Rioli wishes. He's got the option now, in fact, of going nearer to goal, and so he kicks, comes off the post, and goes behind for just one point. So the opening point of the second half, going to Australia's Morris Rioli. So seven points between the teams. And Ireland, of course, have shown us in the first half that when they get 
within goal. They go for goals and six points. This is Pat Spillan wearing Tom Spillan's jersey. Good mark taken by the goalkeeper, Gary McIntosh. He's entitled, just the same as anyone else, to claim a mark. Peter Wilson. The mark is from a catch that you take. The pass having been delivered 20 metres or more from you. Greg Anderson, the Australian goal scorer down towards Morris Rioli. Kept going by Peter Wilson near the far sideline, crossing the 45-metre line. Wilson forward, taking it in to John Platten. And Morris Rioli unable to keep it in play and pushed in the back that time. That's very bad umpiring by that particular uh, official. Watch the elbow come back. See the way Rioli gave him one first. And a really, that should have been to the Irish team. He made physical contact first, and the Irishman was just letting him know that he's out here to win as well. There's a real competitive bite in the match. What a marvellous mark that is by Terry Danaher and John Platten getting involved yet again in front of goal. And again, the ugly side of this international series between Ireland and Australia showing itself and that time it was uh, i think mick lyons who was involved with dale whiteman niall cahalan i think yes cahalan and dale whiteman the two players were involved but look at that for a brilliant mark so terry danaher who's made some superb catches in the game so far and this should be another three points for australia 36 29 the position of the moment This is interesting, got, this, because he's only given him the keeper to beat. He's got a penalty, that's why. So a penalty for Australia, the first in the match so far, because the foul occurred inside the parallelogram. So Terry Danaher, will he go for a goal? Remember, the penalty can be taken from the hand. John O'Leary waits. Here's the shot. The referee whistles up. He'll have it taken again because... Rowan saw, saw something in there. I think what he saw was that the Irishman moved before Terry Danaher actually kicked the ball. So, as Mike Richardson waits perhaps to come back into the action, John Todd watches as Terry Danaher gets his second attempted penalty to beat John O'Leary. He totally mishits, doesn't connect at all, and it's a let off for the Irish. Just one point coming from it, a real let off. 37, 29 the position, into the third quarter. Five minutes gone of that quarter. Peter Wilson's long kick for Australia. Terry Danaher again trying to claim the, ma the mark, but the ball had gone out over the end line, and it's wide. So a real let off that penalty, Michal, the, the kicking clearly letting them down. Yes, they. it's not in their game penalty kicking, their game was played with an oval ball and we can understand why he wasn't at ease kicking that penalty, but uh, the, Greg Blaney there blown for over carrying the ball there, he'd loose ground in front of him, overran uh, free to the Australians. And it's Peter Wilson, as Rowan Soares lines things up. Peter Wilson kicking and a three-point coming from it. So 40 points now the Australians have. Ireland still to score or yet to score in this third quarter. Ireland playing it dangerously short out of defence that time. Brian McGilligan. As the free is taken across to the far wing to Pat Spillan. Here's Mick Fagan. You can see they're having to fight for absolutely everything. Elbows flying in there dangerously. I wonder what this Australian crowd is making of it all. And Mick Fagan's jersey, as you can see, absolutely in bits already. And we had an earlier example of that when uh, Pat Spillan had his jersey well and truly tested. So McNichol for Ireland, John Platten for Australia. And here's Mark Bairstow. Nicely inside, and a good shot by Gerard Healy. And at the second attempt, he thunders it over the crossbar. The red flag raised, Healy the scorer. The crowd applauds, another three points for Australia. 43 points to 29. The gap beginning to widen again. And that long attempt by Chris Langford going out harmlessly over the end line. 
It's an interesting selection indeed, John Hayes. Chris Langford playing in the middle of the field because for Hawthorne he plays as the fullback. Predominantly a defender and possibly the best defender in Australian football, particularly this year with his performances. Here he is again, right under the ball. But it comes to Ireland's John O'Driscoll. And O'Driscoll thumps it over for one point. So he gets Ireland's first point of the second half. There's a long, long way to go yet, however. Greg Anderson overhitting that hand pass. The Australians, whenever, like to keep possession by hand passing the ball to a colleague. The referee's whistle goes in any case. That's going to be a free for a push on Niall Cahalan. You see Teddy McCarthy there, one of the Irish bench members, wasn't selected in the final 22 announced yesterday by Kevin Heffern. And that's Niall Cahalan held by Peter Wilson. Mick Lyons then, the Meath man to take the free, sweeping it across towards Jimmy Kerrigan's wing. Out jumped that time by Chris Langford, the man we were talking about a moment, getting the return pass from John Platten, playing it wide down, intended for Terry Danaher. The team captain now operating at full forward. And that will be an Australian ball. Jared Healy signals his intentions inside. Intended for Rioli, and again it's Mick Fagan who takes it, claims the mark. He's really in the thick of things. He was one of a few players that Kevin Hefferton played for the entire 80 minutes down in Bunbury, and he was so exhausted afterwards, he headed straight back to his hotel and slept for about the next 10 hours. He's a very impressive player. Al Cahalan setting off with Val Daly for Greg Blaney outside in Pat Spillan. Is there a goal on here? Perhaps a fifth goal. Joe McNally's got two already. John O'Driscoll unmarked. It's another goal for Ireland. That was brilliant. Absolutely brilliant use of the ball by the Irishman. And here standing up for themselves because Gary McIntosh, a fierce competitor, didn't like being made look silly by the Irishman. Have a look at this again. Greg Blaney setting it off. The pass outside for Pat Spillan. Joe McNally seeing the unmarked John O'Driscoll, the finishing inch perfect. So Ireland's fifth goal, that's John O'Driscoll now with five goals, and they edge nearer to the Australians' seven points between the teams. It and really now, is truly amazing, Joe, when they use that ball the way they do, how they can make so, such a competitive professional team look silly. Ten minutes into the third quarter. And you can hear the chants of Ireland, Ireland from the supporters here in the Wacker ground in Perth. McLyons playing it wide to Pat Spillan, who's playing just about everywhere. Niall Callan driving it through, intended for his fellow county man, but it runs on for Greg Blaney, who couldn't quite get control on it. Gary McIntosh for Chris Langford. Outside him, he's got Mark Berstow. Finding Berstow, number 20. Langford again, of Peter Wilson rather. Wilson from the 45 meter line, off balance as he drove that one forward, puts it wide. It was a good challenge that time by Mick Holden, who deserves the credit for that inaccur inaccurate uh, clearance by Peter Wilson. Jerry Hargan up towards uh, Greg Blaney's wing, holding his opponent that time, and the referee decides that the Australian held onto the ball too long. Just watch it again. Seems to be Paul Ruse. It's a good decision. Ireland looking promising. Pat Spillan kicking. Joe McNally at the end of it. They'll have to settle for a white flag and one point. Pat Spillan will get the credit for it. Someone else, I think, fingertipped it over the line, but it's 43 to 37. We make it 38. There's only a goal, the difference now, 43-37. And certainly Ireland coming back, coming back very strongly at this Australian team. Gerard Healy taking the free from outside the 45-metre line, hitting it a mighty thumb forward. Great mark, that's a brilliant catch. Brilliant catch that time. It didn't matter that the player in question couldn't hold on to it, brought it to the ground. He had held on to it long enough, and that's... The excellent skills yet again exhibited tonight in Perth by Terry Danaher. Nice fetch, good catch by Jack O'Shea. He's not accepting the mark. This time he wants to play on quickly. The Irish trying to counterburst. Dermot McNichol firing it forward. Jimmy Kerrigan inside, intended for Valdelli of Galway. 
and Chris Langford read the danger signals. Here he is again to pick up the pieces. Intending to play it through towards Dale Whiteman. Instead, it comes for the number seven. Mick Holden and a little bit of argy-bargy that time down there, which the referee is quick to step in and see as Brian McGilligan was very much involved in a tussle that time with Terry Danaher. Due the pace of the game certainly seems to be picking up, doesn't it? The amazing thing is, of course, that everyone was expecting the Irish to be well and truly exhausted by this stage. After all, our performers, John, are amateur players, whereas all these players are professionals. Granted, they would have uh, jobs as well that they would attend to from uh, nine to four, as it were, but uh, they are professional athletes. Certainly, and train, train on the average of about four, four to five times a week. Nine scores in all to Ireland, 22 to Australia, but yet only six between them. Val Daly picking it up. Greg Blaney's beside him. Three against three. Here's the shot. Oh. He's put it over for three points. It counts as a very good score. 40 points now to 43. That's the position as we see it. So there's just an over between the teams. It's the nearest that Ireland has been since the game started. And we are now 40 minutes into the third quarter. Again, the Irish launch an assault on the Australian goal. Val Daly inside towards John O'Driscoll, can't quite hold on to it, and Australia there in numbers, and it's Mark Berster who gets it clear to Gary McIntosh, who in turn gets it away to Craig Holden. Holden, a very fine defender, downfield towards Gerard Healy, that uh, attack diffused by Mick Fagan. And again, another Irish jersey well and truly swung around that time. Kieran Murray is the one. I don't think they'll have a set of jerseys by the time they get to Melbourne Me Hall. It's allowable within the compromise rules catching a player by the jersey. The Irish players are not using it. They would be allowed to do it. I think it's a mistake on their part not to avail of it. We've seen, I think, about three Irish jersey go for naught, as it were, so far. Morris Rioli to take the sideline kick down towards Jared Healy, great catch again, Terry Danaher the one involved, he's taken some marvellous marks in the game. One of his great strengths in Australian game, Terry Danaher, is that he can pull down the, the high ball on a frequent basis and he's showing that cer certainly superbly tonight. A spectacular exhibition by Terry Danaher and so the Essendon man from the 45 metre line looking for another three points, he's got it. Very good kick, very accurate. There was so much talk, of course, before this series began that the Australians wouldn't be able to adapt to the round ball. They certainly have done so. Their kicking has been very true, very accurate. Six points between the sides. Five minutes to go to the end of the third quarter. Maurice Rioli putting this Bank of Ireland-sponsored Ireland team under pressure yet again. Niall Cahalan, late challenge on Niall Cahalan. The referee allows an advantage. Cahalan is still down on the deck at the moment. Jack O'Shea flings it wide. And I'm not quite sure whether that was a pass or whether he just wanted to put it out of place so that attention could be given to Niall Cahalan. Play does continue. Dale Whiteman makes the mark right on the fringe of the square. This is the man they call the flea. In the Australian game, if Jack O'Shea had just did what he did earlier, giving the ball back to the opposition so easily, he'd have what's commonly happened, commonly known as being dragged off the ground. The coach wouldn't be very happy with that situation. Now, Cahalan isn't very happy just at the moment as he receives attention. Here's the kick from Dale Whiteman, and he puts it over the bar for another three-point score. An over brings the Australian total to 49 points. Ireland with 40. Cahalan's back in the match. There's another shot. And that's a white flag, a one-point score for Australia. As Niall Cahalan looking a little groggy, a little gingery, but back with the contest yet again. So a full ten points between the teams now, where just a moment or two ago it was three. It's that kind of match. We hope you're enjoying it. Certainly after the settling down period, it's been spectacular action. We've seen some great goals, some marvellous high fielding, in particular by Terry Danaher for Australia. It'll be interesting indeed to get the reaction not alone of the viewers back in Ireland to this, but of course the Australian public as well watching it on television tonight. I wonder what they'll be making of it. Well, there's still another 25 minutes or thereabouts of the action. Another quarter to go indeed. Ten points between the teams. Maurice Rioli for Australia. 
They've led from start to finish. McLyon's under it, and one wonders will Ireland at this stage have the stamina to maintain the effort for the next 25 minutes as John Platten fires it in. John O'Leary comes out, Mick Holden there too. But a bad pass away, giving it straight, straight to uh, Greg Anderson, kicking off the post. In the Australian game, that would have been regarded as a wide, but of course in Gaelic football, it's very much part of the action. Jerry Hargan on for Greg Blaney, who's been ever present towards the on-rushing Dermot McNichol inside him he's got John O'Driscoll McNichol going oh. it alone taken out of it completely Penalty. unceremoniously by Penalty. McIntosh and everyone's getting involved shades of the Barney Rock incident from Croke Park two years ago when the same kind of thing happened the interesting thing on this occasion is whether the player the Irish player involved here was inside the square or not when McIntosh came out. From here, he looked to be just outside. Kevin Heffernan, Willie Doyle there, one of the Irish bench players, and attention then for the Irishman. Absolutely disgraceful. I mean, at times, at times this evening, I've, I've tried to sort of make allowances for the Australian players, but there's no excuse for that. And McIntosh has been sent off, I think. He hasn't left the field just yet, but clearly Paddy Collins, the umpire the official from Ireland Kevin Heffernan at this stage you can see he is absolutely annoyed incensed by all of that Niall Cahalan still reeling from an earlier injury and this is the incident again Dermot McNichol bravely running through John O'Drisk was the player he was trying to link up with and he got an elbow right into the side of the face and that is nowhere nowhere in the rules of the composite game and an exact replica of what happened Barney Rock and Coke Park in the second international but it means, it means that uh, Australia are now down to one replacement player. So, Australia have made a change. McIntosh has gone off. And Johnston. Dermot McNichol is back on his feet. It's Wayne Johnston, of course, who's gone into goal. Wayne Johnston is known as the dominator when he plays his football in Melbourne. And I wonder if these Irish people on the bench can... Uh, would stand and live up to the next couple of minutes because it's going to be very, very hot stuff indeed. That's McIntosh, the goalkeeper, and he is gone. And he will now come before a disciplinary committee. The control committee will have an awful lot of work to do when they meet tomorrow to discuss the incidents in this match. Five players have now been sent off. And, and this is a disgraceful situation here where he's not going to be allowed a free shot at goal or penalty as such. That was a blatant misuse of the rules, and as I was going to say earlier, you try to make uh, allowances for some of the Australian players, that was disgraceful. But I think that Dermot McNichol was fractionally outside the square when fouled. But, uh, and yet again, again, another fight breaking out here, and it involves Jimmy Kerrigan this time from Ireland. I can't quite see the Australian player involved. But we've had so much good football for about the last half an hour, some really spectacular action. It's shown us what the game can be like. And then, every so often, tempers just flare. Yeah, it seems to be part of games down under here. Lots of good football. It's a tragedy that these incidents occur. Michal, I think it's up to... The, here we see it again. I think... Oh, and that's... Again, there you see now where it was um, Craig, Craig Holden. Holden. And I think it's up to the officials, uh, the John Todds, and the Heffernans of this world to stop this and tell their players and instruct their players to stop this because the game as a spectacle is an excellent spectacle. And there was a meeting of the control committee this morning. They all agreed that these would not be features of the game or should not be. I wonder if anybody passed that message down the line to the players <laughs> because indeed a lot of them didn't seem altogether sure yesterday as to who was playing and who wasn't playing. But, uh, well, let's hope. It will all come right in the end. The first international tonight, or this afternoon, as it is in Ireland, we're seven hours ahead of you. And it's on here at the Wacker Ground in Perth. And the latest position, if anybody's still interested in the score, we hope they are, 50 points for Australia, 43 for Ireland. So seven points in it. And let us hope that common sense will prevail. Gerard Healy. Australia now with a new goalkeeper, remember? Something that Wayne Johnston won't have been anticipating. And this is Dermot McNichol bravely coming forward again. Can he do what he intended to do a little while earlier? It would have been a penalty anyway, I thought. But the referee gave an advantage to Joe McNally. And he's kicked it outside and got just one point for it. 
Well, there was a penalty definitely on there, but the referee quite sensibly played an advantage and very little came of it. Cer Six points between them. Certainly no result for effort there. The effort was put in by the Irishman, but unfortunately it got away from him in the end. And Ireland will have an advantage in the final quarter because Australia reduced to one replacement player and stamina will play a vital part in the final quarter. For anyone who's uh, joined us late, of course, replacement players, you'll hear about this. This is a bit like substitutes, but of course, in this case, it's like basketball. You can bring on or bring off players as often as you wish. Jimmy Kerrigan there going back and uh, fault of the Irish players when they claim a mark, they don't move back far enough. You're allowed to move back as far as you like. They tend to try and hold the ground, but Jimmy Kerrigan went back there, a one point there. So five points between the sides now. There's under a goal in it. And it just shows you the varying fortunes of this game of composite rules football, international football. Nobody's quite got a name for it yet. The marriage of the Irish and the Australian game. Chris Langford, that one comes off the boot of Jerry Hargan. Jimmy Kerrigan booked just a moment ago for that incident that you'll have seen. And it's Dale Whiteman here picking it up uh, 45 metres out from his own goal. Away towards Peter Wilson. Wilson somehow managed to get it on for Gerard Healy. Waiting for the player coming through. A kick and a good point. That's a very good score for Australia. A three-pointer coming that time off the boot of uh, Chris Langford. And 24 minutes gone now in the third quarter, but the uh, referee can signal to the official timekeeper to stop the clock on occasions. He's justified in allowing the 24 minutes for that third quarter. So there's the position, 53 points to 45, just eight points in it. We'll be right back after this commercial break. Well, the break not quite yet, but it is coming up. A game of amazing contrasts, and you never know, Ireland might yet do it. But obviously the incident is not over. When we come back after the break, we'll have a chance, we hope, to see John O'Driscoll's marvellous goal. So stay with us, and we'll be right back with you in a very short time from now. <laughs> Well, some people may be questioning the future of the kind of game we've just seen, but nevertheless, it did produce some marvellous moments, and none better than John O'Driscoll's goal. We'll take a look at that. It happened about nine minutes into the uh, quarter that we have just seen. And uh, just let's take a look at the build-up and what the final result of it was. Brian, you'll take us through this one. Yeah, again, the ball has moved very intelligently between players. They've held on to possession. The steps are used here again, and... Um, you know, uh, what's best in our football is our accuracy and our ability to put away with a round ball. So, Thank uh, you very much, Brian. Sorry to stop you there. Thank you for taking us through it. We're going to uh, take ourselves through the atmosphere out to Australia now, once again, out to Perth. We're just back with the action for the fourth and final quarter. Australia leading game has just restarted. John O'Leary then making a catch. And during the interval between third and fourth quarter, we understand that John Todd was very, very fired up indeed. Quite annoyed with his charges, believing they were trying to walk the ball in, demanding a huge effort from them. Kevin Heffernan, meanwhile, encouraged his team quite sensibly to play with the breeze as they are for this last quarter and to avail of the prevailing conditions. And it would appear that Australia are now playing with 14 men. Perhaps a, an extra man has been put off and on to us. They would appear to have only 14 men on the field right now. Mick Fagan then, booting it out over the sideline. Mick Fagan playing right corner back, as it were, in Gaelic football. As we watch, Mark Naley. And Australia having lost their goalkeeper in the last quarter. And that would account for the man short for five minutes. Perhaps the five minutes play is not up yet. So Australia get another point. The first of this final quarter, Mark Naley, the scorer that time. This is Pat Spillane. Nine points between the teams at the moment. Australia, the leaders. And what a brave and gutsy performance this is by the Irish down here in Perth tonight. Australia mounting another high challenge. Terry Danaher. A high-powered attack, he kicks and he gets three points and over for Terry Danaher, who's been Australia's top performer in the match. So very quickly, where there was just eight points between them at half-time, there's now 12. 
So is there an Irish response? There's still plenty of time, just two minutes of the last 20 gone. The referee whistles up. He saw a foul down there. He whistles against John O'Driscoll. And that's a free to Australia. We'll see it yet again. And O'Driscoll seemed to swing his opponent around, which is not permitted. One could be excused for thinking it was because it's happened so regularly tonight. Craig Holden rather than uh, Mick Holden as the caption read. Craig Holden for Australia. And nobody able to claim a mark that time as the ball is booted down by Niall Cahalan towards John O'Driscoll, an impressive performer. He swung around again and this time the referee says it's not a foul. So a degree of confusion. Pat Spillan into Greg Blaney. Well blocked down, brilliantly so, by Peter Wilson, by Jared Healy, rather, to Dale Whiteman. And Australia launching the counter burst. And this time it is Peter Wilson unable to keep the ball in play. And you just caught a quick glimpse that time of John Todd, the Australian coach down there in the green Gansey. That's Peter Wilson. Fiercely competitive player. And confirmation of the umpires here at this first international down in Australia. And that's a good attempt, and it's gone over the bar, a three-point attempt from that long, long punt from out the sideline. John O'Driscoll was there at the finish, but Ireland getting their first points of this last quarter, 56 to 48. And Australia now back with a full complement of 15 players on the field. Chris Langford. Morris Rioli, who'll be remembered after some memorable performances two years ago. Paul Ruse to John Platten. Fisted out by Brian McGilligan. Niall Cahalan. Driving it down into space. This is what the coach demanded. Pat Spillan is playing very far forward. Jared Healy, last line of defence bar, the goalkeeper for Australia. Craig Holden keeping it in play. Up it goes towards Dale Whiteman, very near the sideline. Cahalan's in there with uh, Dermot McNichol, and that's going to be an Australian ball. There's the smallest man on the park, five foot six inch Dale Whiteman. Confirmation of the score at the moment, 57 48. The official score, well, the scoreboard on the ground here says 46 56 48. Uh, that could easily happen, the score may be wrong, if it is just by one point. It's either 56 to 48 or 57. Meanwhile, Mick Holden is swung around and the referee says that's a free to Ireland. John Platten, the player involved, just watch this now. There's no way that's at all in the rules. At least the umpire is being consistent so far in this quarter anyway. Jack O'Shea. Jack's been disappointing tonight, for mine anyway. Down towards Greg Blaney. Made a mark and uh, the referee says play on. To Dermot McNichol. McNichol with a player outside him, Valdelli. Kicking, kicking rather wildly. He gets one point. It takes Ireland's score up to 49. So still a gap to be bridged. Rather a wild clearance out of defence. word from down on the pitch is that there is a considerable breeze down there at the moment. Ireland playing with the breeze behind them. Mick Lyons driving it in towards John O'Driscoll. Greg Blaney behind him. What a good catch by John O'Driscoll. Greg Blaney there beside him. Waiting for the support to come, but uh, covered up that time by the Australian defence. Peter Wilson crossing his own 45-metre line on towards Greg Anderson. Sensibly overhitting the pass to uh, Morris Rioli. Inside him he's got Mike Richardson. He's aiming this one towards Richardson. Goes over his head and Jack O'Shea. Well, he's a player who does an awful lot of covering Jack O'Shea. Back in defence to help out his fellow defenders from time to time. Joe McNally wide into the corner. John O'Driscoll, number nine. O'Driscoll kicking a very acute angle. He's got one point. He was looking for a red flag. He'll have to settle for a white one. And... The latest position confirmed, we can tell you, is 57 for Australia, 50 for Ireland. So Ireland needing a goal and a behind to get on level terms. The referee allows an advantage to Chris Langford. Langford, 45 metres out from goal. 
and this is where the Australians will really test the stamina and the pace of the Irish. John O'Leary, who's so quick off his line, not alone has he a, a goal of 6.5 metres wide to cover, but of course he has the two behinds to make sure he doesn't give away any loose one-point scores also. Down to Dermot McNichol. McNichol has a plenty of pace, ranging in on goal, looking for a goal number six for the Irish, carrying it out over the end to be helped out over that end line and the referee has blown the whistle and it'll be interesting to see just what he decides he's decided it's a kick out for Australia this is the incident yet again McNichol ranging in on goal trying to keep it in play back live with the action as John O'Driscoll has swung around that ball coming loose away from an Australian defender to Greg Blaney the down man 20 meters out from goal leaving it behind to Peter Wilson and at this stage, one's money, I suppose, would have to be on the stronger, fitter-looking Australian team to come good at the finish, but they've been made to fight for it every step of the way, and they've shown themselves to be vulnerable in front of goal. And when Ireland get within a 20-metre sniff of the Australian goal, well, it's a goal that they're looking for. And that's been the difference of the match so far. Jack O'Shea and Pat Spillane leaving it to Mick Lyons. Here's Pat Spillane, such a fine athlete outside to Greg Blaney nobody near him for just a moment so he's got time to aim the shot perfectly inch perfectly between the posts raise the red flag and it's three points for Ireland it's a great kick 57 53 just four points separating the sides eight minutes into the into the final quarter 57 53 Ireland with five goals to show for the opening, what is it, 40, a little bit more than that, of the match so far. The Irishmen look very threatening. They're really determined to win this first test. Good mark taken by Joe McNally, who opts to play on. Intended for Greg Blaney, who got that fine three-pointer just a moment ago, but that's a very good catch by Mark Naley, the number five for Australia. Joe McNally has it driven back right to him, and this time he does avail of the moment's respite. And Kieran Murray, looking battle-weary at this stage, watches as Joe McNally, all 16 stone of him, thunders the shot down, but there's nobody there in the Australian goal mouth except Mark Naley. Well, a loose pass, but eventually picked up. And here's the familiar figure of the tall Chris Langford, one of Australia's best players. Anderson that attack stemmed for just a moment and the referee says I don't like that particular tackle and so he awards the free to Ireland for that pull that time on Brian McGilligan again you can feel that the Australians are starting to worry because the crowd didn't like that and they're a little bit worried that the Irish are going to take this game away from it just held by the jersey the referee might have allowed it Gerard Healy for Australia, overhitting the pass, and it's booted away by Mick Holden. And just out of shot, I noticed Pat Spillane going down awkwardly on the cricket wicket. Nobody near him by any means. Uh, he just slipped on what is a very, very hard surface. Now Cahalan over towards the wing that Jack O'Shea's on. This is Chris Langford ranging in a drop kick. John O'Leary well under it. Lions. So the Irish with everything to place. Just four points between the teams, but Australia looked threatening from that mistake. Peter Wilson. Has he put it over for a one-pointer? Yes, he has. There wasn't too much in it. Very near to being a wide, but Australia now picking up all the loose ball going in midfield. Dale Whiteman kicking. Well held by John O'Leary yet again. And it goes across to Jack O'Shea's wing. There's just nine minutes of this first international in Australia between Ireland and Australia left. Ireland with a lot of work to do still. Five points to make up, as you see. Kevin Herfinan encouraging them. This is that last incident as Dermot McNichol is grounded and it's brought Kevin Heffernan to his feet. And Joe hasn't Jack O'Shea lifted. He's certainly leading the Irish team very well in this last quarter. Well, he's a great ambassador, of course, for our game. And the Breeze helping Ireland for the final 11 minutes, and they're the more likely team to score a goal at the closing stage. 
Mick Holden holding his feet for just a moment and then slipping on the surface near the cricket wicket, which is after being sprinkled all day. And as a result, it's quite slippery. And it's Mike Richardson who avails of the error. And that's what it is. A three-point score for Australia, which takes their score along to 61 points, 53 for Ireland. So, eight points separating the sides. And the last two scores by Australia have been direct, direct results of mistakes from the Irishmen. So perhaps indications of tiredness creeping into the Irish game. They've done well, very well, to last the pace. Because the theory up to now had been that Ireland would have to set off at a gallop, do well in the opening two quarters, and then have to resist the Australian pressure in the last quarter. But tonight, it hasn't been that kind of game. Greg Blaney. They have to get more Irishmen down in the goal mouth. There's, only, there's too many Australians down there. Time is running out for them. Just eight minutes remaining. Greg Blaney takes the kick and just gets a white flag. So it's a behind one point. 54 now for Ireland, and they trail by seven points. Niall Cahalan, Ireland's number three, towards Dermot McNichol, one of the heroes of the last series, in particular the two games in Croke Park. At that time it's John Platten who picks up the pieces. Gerard Healy for Australia swings it wide on this near side of the field towards Peter Wilson. There's great energy, great activity in this match. And when the game is played in a fair and competitive spirit, it really is a delight to behold. That's Brian McGilligan. McGilligan, one of the lesser-known stars, I suppose, on this Irish team. He just made the Derry team this year, in fact, but he's impressed Kevin Heffernan in the various trials. And now Ireland in a promising and challenging position. 45 minutes out from goal, and Pat Spallan moving forward, and it's Colm O'Rourke who's taking the kick. Pullum normally very accurate, has ballooned that one up into the air. A Gary Owen that comes back to him. And oh. a fish thrown out wildly that time. Jimmy Kerrigan, the player who's in the thick of the action. Play continues, it was a loose fist. Kerrigan came off second best, he's back on his feet again. As we watch the Australian number 20, Mark Bairstow, kick it out over the sideline. So, into the final quarter, that's the score, 61-54, just under six minutes to go. A good mark made by Kieran Murray, as Monaghan followers, I suppose, have never seen him with a jersey torn open. Healy makes a good mark, and the Australians now with their backs to the wall, taking it on the chin for the last few minutes, and... As John Hayes, one of my co-commentators here, was remarking the last two Australian scores essentially coming from errors. That goes over the head of John Platten, but it runs kindly for Mike Richardson, but his shooting boots left behind him. Here's Jimmy Kerrigan proving that he's fit again after that, taking that loose punch, a punch that would have done justice to any of the action we'd have seen at the National Stadium. Shipping the challenge hitting it wide into the top left-hand corner of the field, but the only man there is Chris Langford. The fitter Australians taking the fight to the Irish. John Platten, Morris Rioli, dancing round Mick Fagan, booted clear by Kieran Murray. Whistle sounds and it's a free to Australia. And the Australian fans here urging their team on. They're loving every minute of it. For them, I suppose, it's had the right amount of physical uh, might as well. For us, it's perhaps a little bit too physical. Morris Rioli towards Terry Danaher. And he's been well marshalled for most of this last 20 minutes, but that's a marvellous mark. He really inspired his team in the second and third quarters of the game. And look at that, one-handed, taking it down despite the attentions of Jack O'Shea. Tremendous pressure applied by Jack O'Shea then again, showing the commitment that he wants Ireland to really stay in this fight. This is an important kick. It's a red flag, and Terry Danaher, the Australian captain, leading the way in front of the fans here in Perth, making it 65-54. Australia the leaders. 64-54, rather, 10 points between the sides. So the Irish know what they must do, and that is get goals and get two of them at least. Mark Naley, or Tony McGuinness, rather. Comes back down to Kieran Murray, belting it out Gaelic fashion. 
to Greg Blaney. And of course, it's important to emphasize this is not a Gaelic football international, rather it's an international involving Gaelic football players playing composite rules. The first of three internationals here in Perth tonight, the others coming up in Melbourne and Adelaide over the next two weeks. The referee's whistle sounds yet again. This time it's a, a free against uh, Jimmy Kerrigan. So 10 points separating the sides, three minutes to go. Can the Irish make up the difference? Chris Langford kicking out over the sideline. So, at this point, let's put the question to our two guests here. Michal, is there any hope for the Irish? There is still hope. As I said earlier, they're likely or more likely than Australia to score a goal. It's goals they need. Australia possibly a little bit fitter at this point. Quicker to the ball. And a what about John? Superior fitness. I think Lee Hall virtually answered the question then, Joe. The fitness of the Australians is really coming to the fore at this point. The way they're using the ball certainly would indicate to me that they'll go on and win this game. Dale Whiteman trying to wrap it up with Mike Richardson kicking and Mike Richardson scoring. He scores a behind a one-point score. And that's the second he's got in the last couple of minutes. So now it's 65 to 54. Ireland trail by 11 points. Colm O'Rourke coming in search of a goal that would give them some hope. Down towards John O'Driscoll. Good mark. Nicely taken. The shot. And it's gone off the post. And it's a white flag. John having changed his shirt, you'll note, wearing number 25 now, where early he was wearing number 9. So at least it reduces the leeway, but to 10 points. It would have really brought the crowd to their feet if he'd have scored a goal then. Jerry Hargan's kick. Greg Blaney, great oh. save by the goalkeeper. Wayne Johnston, Australia's substitute goalkeeper, produces a save that would have done justice to the man at the other end, John O'Leary. A brilliant save from Greg Blaney, keeping the Australians in it. Just two minutes of the action remaining. Kieran Murray back inside his own 45-meter line. Outside of his Val Daly, the Galway man. Trying to inspire the Irish as Kerrigan kicks it forward. Good mark taken by Greg Blaney. He opts to play on instead of slowing the game down. But the referee saw that there was a wraparound challenge that time. And he's giving Ireland the free. A free from 45 metres. Paddy Collins there from Westmeath. Signalling the free. 65. 55 is the position. Ireland badly needing a goal. So will Greg Blaney opt to kick it inside for McNichol or for Jack O'Shea, who's now standing on the edge of the small square? He's overkicked and he's put it behind for just one point, a white flag, when a shorter kick on that occasion might have suited. So, Wayne Johnston, having checked the score and the position with now 15 seconds remaining, Ireland still applying the pressure, still playing on right to the finish, and there's the final whistle. Ireland get a late consolation score, taking this tally up to 57, but it's Australia who win the opening match of the series, winning by 65 points to 57. Nine, sorry, eight points between the sides at the finish, but we've had some memorable moments, Michal. Some memorable moments, and perhaps Australia deserved the victory. They had far greater possession, but Ireland's ability to score goals against the Australians' inability to do likewise kept them in touch for long spells. I suppose we should be congratulating you, John Hayes. No, well, Ger, I'm Irish through and through. I was born in Cork, and I still refer to myself as Irish. Consequently, that's why they call, us, they call me Irish Hayes. But I was very proud to be Irish tonight. I think that the, the pride that the Irishmen showed themselves, particularly in that last quarter, made this uh, tremendous first test something that I'll certainly remember. And I know that the big crowd here will. Australia, the superior fitness, the fact that they're professionals in comparison to, the, uh, to their Irish counterparts. In, in real terms, that's what's really took the, the Australians to a win in the end result. John Hayes and Michal Amarherthig, my thanks to you both for your comments during the game, a game here in Perth, won by Australia by 65 points to 57. We're now going back to Dublin. And our thanks to the commentary team there in Perth. We will be hearing the comments of Tom Spillane a little bit later on in the programme, but uh, for now it's the comments from our panel we're interested in. And Seamus Eldridge, the Australian commentator, saying there at the end that fitness seemed to be the determining factor. Was that how you saw it? Yeah, I think it was, but um, 
the game itself uh, overall was very disappointing for me. On the evidence of that match, I don't see any future whatever in the composite rules and uh, f uh, or that it would be a help to Gaelic games because um, I was uh, very disappointed with the standard of referee and on the Australian side, I think the Australian referee, I, I'd be slow to criticise referees, but I think the Australian, Jimmy Kerrigan, uh, must be wondering, he got two clear punches in the face and, and the Australian player was left on the field in, in one case and in the other case he didn't even get a free. Uh, I'm sure the control committee will have to do a lot of looking into it. Mm. I think that is a good facet of the thing that they can meet quite quickly after the game. I think it's something that should be introduced here. And, uh, and uh, certainly uh, the standard of refereeing on the Australian side was, was very poor. Uh, Brian, when a distinguished referee criticises another referee, it uh, makes you wonder, doesn't it really, about the actual standard of that which he was looking at? And I think you'd concur in this case. You had questions about the refereeing. I, I had to some extent, you know, I'd be slow, I'd be slow to comment on referees, it might get me into trouble somewhere, but um, uh, no, I, I see the, the losing of the game in a different light, I, don't, uh, uh, I think that the Irish had the chances to win it if they had played it, the brand of football that we know they were capable of, I think that between this and the next test they're going to have to spend a lot of time perfecting the skills that are necessary for this type of game. And you, I think you a couple of times you expressed something close to despair and anger, and I jotted down one or two comments of yours here. You you pointed out, for example, <coughs> pardon me, for example, that Ireland. You said they're not using the advantage of running and showing and passing the round ball. Yeah, I, 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 that, that's what I'm basically saying. That there was uh, times in the game when people were running and they were soloing the ball, and to me, it's di more difficult to solo the ball than bounce the ball. And on other occasions, as we saw there, the, the missed kicking was very bad in, in situations where they could have taken a mark or whatever. But uh, I think that, uh, you know, the, the referee, it's difficult to referee that type of a situation. And OK, we might be critical of the Australian referee that he didn't do things that we felt could have been in our favour. But, um, you know, with new rules coming in like that and whatnot, it's, it's very difficult to, to, to put up with fellas who are just, if one fella gets a thump and another fella's going to thump him back, it's very difficult for the referee to do anything about that. So basically, think for the next game, I think the Irish just have to perfect the skills that are necessary for this game. Gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Seamus Aldridge. Thank you, Brian. So there you are. Still questions over what happened today and also questions about the future of the game. And that, of course, is something that you'll also see live on RTE television. But now it's time for the news headlines.